what is up guys so um I'm, I'm just filming this post like the full session itself it's been like an absolute marathon of just pumping content for the past like 70 hours quote unquote just on the 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 entire linkedin course that uh i've basically created here a lot of value uh 100 like i i personally feel that a lot of this information is the type of information that um other people would base courses on and charge money for as well but uh, i essentially decided to just drop it all for free because why not i could have added it to the growth hacking bootcamp but the bootcamp is more high level but yeah so briefly in this segment so in, in this like I don't even know i think it's gonna be two and a half hours in these two and a half hours i basically released content with regards to optimizing your linkedin profile so just for max conversions and max profile views visits etc uh manual outreaches as well i covered sales navigator as well for just more in-depth manual outreaches we covered linkedin ads with a primary focus towards uh email and uh conversation based ads as well we also covered linkedin live we covered events we covered groups and how you can basically utilize them for your outreach as well just a lot of value a lot a lot of value um in the description right below there are timestamps for all the chapters of this course guide i really don't know what to call it uh but just to assist you with the navigation of all the content itself because if you lose something and then you have to just rewind it's gonna be crazy um but essentially yeah forgive any mistakes that i might have made uh with regards to either mispronouncing something or mislabeling something uh, the, the majority of the course 99 of it is like totally correct but uh just from the uh, continuous content creation at some point you might mispronounce something or uh, misstate something etc so you will find a couple of those quote-unquote bloopers where i just misspeak um especially after you just hear your voice for like 2.5 hours just talking to a camera uh over and over again over the time span of like uh, and editing the content it's uh, yeah and uh, yeah essentially if there's um, if there's any variations if there's any results success etc drop it in the comments below smash the like button subscribe as well enable notifications just to help the algorithm and um, i hope you guys enjoy it it's I doubt that uh, most of you will essentially just consume all the content in one sit down. It's the type of video that you'd have playing whilst, I don't know, you're running errands or like a uh, morning podcast style or like uh, a video to go to sleep to. To assist you with consuming the content as well, timestamps in the bottom to basically help you with navigating the full video. Uh, consume it, you know, the way you do, but uh, I hope it adds value to you guys. Make sure to also check out our growth hacking community. So there's a link right in the, it's the first pinned comment itself. And for additional resources, just check the description. Um, enjoy. Set. So in this segment, we're basically going to be covering the aspect of profile optimization. So when I say profile optimization, I basically am referring to building out your profile in a way of where it's just essentially getting the maximum results of what it's able to get. So optimizing it from an SEO standpoint, uh, optimizing it from just the standpoint of where it actually looks like a, a, a pretty cool LinkedIn profile and it's a, a well-built one with a profile that's been thought out as opposed to anything and uh, essentially just maximizing the results that you're able to get from it um, essentially. So. A couple of things that I do need to mention here. Uh, first and foremost, LinkedIn does have SEO enabled. So the search bar, the basic search bar and the sales navigator search bar do have SEO enabled. So essentially, if you search for quote unquote growth hacker in this case, uh, you realize that I might be amongst some of the results. So depending upon just how saturated the industry is, um, I think if we enable a uh, if we enable location as well, then I might uh, I might come up. But normally, usually under under normal circumstances, um, I should come up under the search term of growth hacker because it's included in my job type. So if you head over to my profile here, you realize that uh, growth hacker is something that's included. If we search for it with the emojis, don't ask why I include emojis. It's just uh, something that I did a few months ago and I never removed it. I think I should come up first no still no so people um yeah in this case i guess because there's just a, a bunch of other growth hackers um i'm not the the first option here but you do come up if you search for uh seo you'll see people who have seo within their title essentially so title 
quote unquote, a CEO, CEO, CEO. So did I say SEO? CEO. Um, so it is a SEO enabled uh, search system, quote unquote. If you search for a company name as well, it's gonna come up. If you search for now, you can actually search for services as well. So I think it's um, services, yeah. And uh, you can basically do service categories marketing, etc. And this is a new addition that LinkedIn added to their system where you can basically navigate through uh, through the results by using services, essentially. And it's something that when you're optimizing your profile, so we'll just take it step by step. Uh, we'll take it from the, the cover photo itself. We'll take it from the profile photo. We'll take it from the companies, the education, etc. just to showcase exactly what's what. So uh, to edit this, of course, uh, first name, last name, pretty basic stuff. Uh, what's this? Open profile. So set. I'll explain that in a bit as well. But your first name and your last name should essentially be your first name and a last name. I, I don't recommend that you include emojis here or anything uh, too special, just um, the exact same way that it is. And then former name, if you've ever had a name change, you can basically include that as well. Record name pronunciation. Uh, this is basically a feature on the mobile app where if you record your f name pronunciation, you're gonna have something like a speaker here, which if you press it is basically gonna play out your voice recording of you uh, saying your name so that people know how to pronounce it. Now, there's a bit of a th there's a bit of an additional point here because people sometimes use the record name pronunciation thing to sort of just record their own like catch of the profile. So like if you need any marketing services, DM me, for example. Uh, and it's a pretty intuitive or like kick-ass way to essentially get that done. So that is one of the possibilities out there. Then uh, on the flip side as well. So um, your current position, essentially where you're currently working at the moment. So depending upon the positions that you add in the past or in the present as well, they're gonna come up here and you can basically select one. I think it's gonna, yeah, so it changes the, the position. Then your education as well. So whatever courses you've completed, anything that you've completed, et cetera, you can add it here, any certifications that you might have as well. Uh, show education in my intro. So if we untick this, then it basically removes the education aspect from here. If we tick it, right, it basically shows it right here. So IMC in this case. The, and then country, region, your industry, and contact info. Your industry is important because industry will basically showcase for what search results you come up for. So if you go for, let's say CEO, um, if we go for CEO, and then if we do a industry based search, which you can do right here. So industry, right, add an industry, and then we type in market research, right? This basically means that my profile is gonna come up in this batch of results that LinkedIn is basically able to pull up. So market research, etc. So it's pretty important to update your industry because you're gonna be getting the most relevant requests that are just uh, pre-built for you, quote unquote, as opposed to just including an irrelevant industry that isn't necessarily connected to you or connected to what you're doing. Uh, I essentially recommend that you, you keep it updated. So there's, um, LinkedIn has a bunch of industries to be honest. So you won't be able to, if it's a sub industry or anything of that sort, you won't be able to selectively say it's that, but they have like a selection of, I think 70 plus industries from which you can choose. So that's the industry standpoint. And then contact info, uh, this you can basically adjust here. So this is basically your contact info and whether you want it to be visible or not. Uh, Keep in mind that you should be careful with this because including your email in LinkedIn, right, will of course showcase your email to people that actually want to outreach to you and they want to send you a personalized email. But at the same time, it will also expose your profile to scrapers and automation tools that just pick up a lot of data from all around, right? And essentially mass message people uh, through email. So if you do include your email and if you do not hide it, you can expect to essentially have people uh, send you emails saying, hey, uh, found your profile on LinkedIn, etc." It's just an expectation that you should have. And then your birthday, your phone, etc. apply. So that's the segment with regards to the, the, the intro part of your profile, your location, etc. save. Then at the same time, so the, the talks about section, I'm trying to see if we can uh, uh, edit it. This is basically a section LinkedIn has a new feature that recently rolled out as well. I only uh, activated it, uh, give or take two to three weeks ago. And this section basically makes you a LinkedIn content creator, quote unquote. So depending upon, uh, depending upon 
whether you activate it or not, you also have the ability to essentially choose the topics or the hashtags that you talk about. So in my case, of course, it's primarily about branding, business and marketing. I think I wanted to choose growth hacking as well, but I wasn't able to find it. But that's something that you enable once LinkedIn gives you the feature. So LinkedIn doesn't immediately give you the, give you the feature. You need to start posting some content here and there. And after some time, LinkedIn will essentially uh, I think you'll get a notification somewhere here which says, are you a content creator? And once that's done, you can essentially select the topics that you talk about. There aren't any additional major benefits that this unlocks at the present moment, but I do think that there's gonna be additional utility to this feature in the future, just not yet, because it's um, I think it's like a beta feature or something of that sort. And then uh, these segments right here, so providing services and show recruiters you're open to work and then share that you're hiring. So. The key one, essentially for me, because I, I don't want to get hired or anything of that sort, is the providing services aspect. So if you edit it, uh, you should essentially just have the ability to select the services that you provide, right? And add a small about, uh, some additional selections with regard to with regards to where you're located, whether you can work remotely, etc. Who can see the services that you provide? Um, this, the selections that you select upon the service will essentially reflect upon whether you can be caught on search. So on the services aspect right here. So this is, again, it's something new. It's only something that's been around for like a month or two right now. And it essentially allows people that are looking for services to find service providers. So services, uh, service categories, so marketing, show, and then essentially here you have like a bunch of people that are essentially offering marketing services. So you can target them, cross target them, et cetera, you choose. And then with a location based, uh, with a location based uh, selection as well, you can basically target them uh, just from a, a, a geographical standpoint as well. So that's the aspect with regards to the services. Then on the flip side as well. So the, Additional point, and this is a pretty important point, is the featured content point. So the featured content, not only can you feature uh, content that you've engaged in, but you can also feature your most important content. So the content that you're most proud of, quote unquote. So in my case, because I produce content on YouTube, I, uh, I run a growth hacking community as well. I have a lot of content and featuring it on my LinkedIn profile, essentially adds social proof with regards to who I am and what I do. Because at the moment you have, of course, several types of people on the internet, several types of service providers, to be entirely honest. But the ones that stand out the most, uh, just from, a, from an outreach perspective, are essentially the ones that produce content. Because if you are contacted by somebody that offers marketing services, and then on the flip side, you also see that they have a YouTube channel with uh, 10K subs uh, for, just providing thought leadership within the marketing sphere, this elevates the service provider to the next level. It makes you think, ah, so they provide services and they're also a well-established thought leader. It makes sense to speak to them. The exact same thing can essentially just be showcased within your profile from the featured standpoint. So by featuring your content here and by including your best performing content, you're essentially able to indicate that you're a thought leader within the space, right? And of course, depending upon the reactions and the likes that you have, uh, this basically resonates further with the people that come across your profile. These are essentially just in my personal opinion, like your CTAs, your call to actions. Uh, with me, the majority of my CTEs with anything that I do are essentially just check out my content because I know that from the quality of the content, additional results will come. People will get engaged, they'll join the community, they might join the bootcamp, book a call with us, etc. cetera. It's a, it's a pretty well thought out process. So my CTAs are primarily my content, but it can also be a CTA of let's say your agency. So in this case, if you open it, it opens up inside insight. And then from here, you can book a call, check the bootcamp. Uh, or potentially join the growth hacking community. So that's growth.insideinside.at. So that's um, that's something to keep note of as well. Here, essentially, you wanna include your CTAs and make sure that people are essentially being driven towards something. Of course, the main CTA is connect and send a message, but if they want more information, make sure that it's uh, located here in your featured bar. So your, uh, your, your agency, your whatever, your content, your article, so on and so forth. Then the activity section, there isn't really a lot of uh, optimization that you can do here. What it essentially does is 
it just showcases your latest activity. So if you click on uh, see all, what it's gonna do is it's basically gonna showcase your latest posts, posts, your latest activity, etc. And uh, let's click on posts and then documents. These are the slides, the following ones. So I'll guide, I'll guide you over those in the content marketing section. But if you click on posts, that's all the polls, all the posts, everything, etc. So that's the uh, see all activity. Not a lot that you can do here. Uh, just be, be aware of the fact that, you know, if you engage with any other content, it's going to come up here. So I see like a bunch of people like trash talking each other on LinkedIn. If they do, it's going to come up on their activity bar and you'll essentially see that this person is a trash talker. So my about section isn't like tremendously well optimized. It's a about section that I just created. I don't know. I created it back in 2019 and uh, it's pretty cheesy to be entirely honest, but um, I just want to see if you can add links as well. Your about section should essentially just be exactly about you. Personally speaking, I like about sections that are written in third person. So just like written about you, quote unquote, as opposed to written about yourself. Cause if you're writing it about yourself, it's like you're trying to prove something. Whereas if it's written in third person, it's like, okay, this is who this person is spoken from a third person perspective. So if you can write an about section, uh, just about your name from a third person, that's pretty well. There are, cause again, it's a pretty big blob of text and many people are like gonna experience a bit of a writer's block when they're typing out their uh, about section. When you create your about section, uh, if you type in, if you go on Google and you type in about section LinkedIn templates, you're gonna come across a few that just serve as like the, the backbone that you can use in order to basically create your own about section. So they're, they're pretty straightforward, just convert it to a third person perspective, and then you have a pretty decent about, quote unquote. So that's um, something that you can do. Now, additionally, on the um, your dashboard, this is less of a profile optimization section, but it's essentially like the, the, the key, it showcases the key KPIs of your profile. So who's viewed your profile, how many post views you have, search appearances. Now creator mode is the element that I was discussing before. So that's the, the new thing that LinkedIn rolled out. And from here you can basically adjust the uh, talks about section and the my network. So that's essentially your network. And then my items, things that you save, quote unquote. The key thing with regards to your dashboard is the all-star feature. Because as you're building out your profile, this will essentially change over time. So it's going to start from like a, a basic level. And then once your profile is fully optimized, once you've added an about section, experience, contact details, etc., this will then go all star. So you should be aiming for uh, an all star rating. And then you know that your profile is well optimized, not necessarily from an SEO standpoint, but just up to the standpoint of uh, quote unquote, like uh, LinkedIn standards, quote unquote. So pretty important to include and keep an eye on as well. Then these are profile views, post views, search appearances, search appearances. Uh, that, that's the element that tells you how well SEO optimized you really are, quote unquote. I'm not too SEO optimized from my perspective because I primarily focus on outbound outreach, but the search appearances module right there will essentially showcase just how well you appear on search results. If we click on it, uh, number of times your profile appeared between 27th and August 3rd, who's searching and then what your searches do, keywords they use. So I show up for a founder and business development specialist. And then if you click on this, I think that's gonna, basically going to be uh, a guide, right? Want to improve your profile is updated, update your profile essentially. So they're basically uh, incentivizing you to update your profile so that all the records are up to date, of course, because LinkedIn is a database as opposed to above, uh, Primarily LinkedIn is a database and secondarily it's a social media network because sales navigator is where they make most of their money uh, as far as I know and of course the ads and their ability to make money with sales navigator and the ads depends upon how well structured the records are and how up to date the information is as well. So LinkedIn is incentivized by all means to keep everything up to date. That's just more of a, a, a meta analysis, but yeah. Then your experience as well. So all the companies that you essentially worked for. Uh, personally speaking, I really wouldn't like include, you have a lot of profiles where they include like small achievements, small jobs, etc., where they've worked for somewhere for like two months or they've interned, etc. Unless it's like an internship at JP Morgan, I don't really see like a lot of uh, 
a lot of reason to include it. Now, of course, if your work experience or like your your uh, your work career hasn't been like built out to the point of where you can include anything worthwhile, uh, you haven't started anything, you haven't made anything, then in that case, of course, it makes sense to basically include everything. But the key ones that you should include are essentially like the, the, the most important ones. So like Inside Insight, something I'm actively working on, IBC Group partnered with them. Uh, then this is just to showcase my experience with uh, just business development in the past. And then essentially, yeah. And then the education standpoint, pretty important as well, just to showcase that, you know, you have a, a, an upper tier uh, education. Then the most quote unquote, most important part. This is, it's a bit of a gimmick, quote unquote. It isn't necessarily like the, it doesn't optimize your profile for like SEO or anything of that sort, but it's a bit of, um, it's like uh, likes on Facebook. I've heard of somebody mention it in the exact same way before. Essentially what you do here is you add your skills, like nobody pays attention to this. Uh, nobody's ever gonna go on a profile and see like the skills, unless they're like recruiters, but even as far as I know, recruiters automate a lot of their actions. They will, bar they will barely look at this from uh, uh, like um, a hands-on standpoint. So what you do here is you essentially add your skills, like whatever skills you might have. So in my case, uh, a lot of marketing skills, a lot of sales and business development skills, entrepreneurial skills, etc. So you add them here. And then when people hop over onto your profile, they can essentially endorse you for your skill, which is something that I've covered in the uh, manual outreach method, where you can essentially outreach to people, send them a connection note and a connection request, and then endorse them for, for skill. And then whenever that happens, if you click on uh, notifications, you'll see that there's an alert there saying that somebody not, uh, endorsed you. So if you're outreaching, it's essentially a two touch approach where they receive a notification for the message and the connection request. And then they also receive a notification because somebody endorsed them. So it's it's like buying somebody a cup of coffee, quote unquote. It's uh, You can use it to your advantage when you're outreaching. You can also add it on your profile and in most cases you should. And slowly over time you'll get endorsements, but it's not too important. As a matter of fact, what's even more important than the above is essentially recommendations. If there's one thing that you should hunt out when you're just developing your LinkedIn profile, it's profile recommendations, quote unquote, because Profile recommendations are essentially just like writing your about section in third person, but it's people recommending you and just talking about work that you've done before, uh, talking about uh, how you've worked in the past, etc. So it's essentially that. I have three. I know people that have a lot more and they have some pretty kick-ass recommendations as well, but it's clout, quote unquote. It, it's just clout. It's flexing. You know, it's the uh, corporate flex, essentially. Um, what's his name? I keep forgetting the name of the, the YouTube channel. He keeps doing uh, just LinkedIn uh, uh, LinkedIn related videos, but it's uh, sarcastic. Um, I'm sure that he'd have uh, he'd have a lot to say about the recommendation page uh, section. But essentially, yeah. So that's the recommendation uh, segment itself, essentially. So just add them here and uh, yeah, request them. So. Tell people, look, I'm building out a LinkedIn profile. Uh, you can ask them for a recommendation here. And then you select who to ask, when you worked with, and they'll get a request. And then if they accept it, they can essentially add uh, a recommendation on your profile. Now, you don't necessarily have to request it through the LinkedIn system. You can, of course, request it through just a more like warm approach. Like if you have somebody's phone number, call them, tell them, look, I'm building out a LinkedIn page. Can you add a couple of recommendations, please? And in most cases, it shouldn't be a problem. As a matter of fact, one thing that you can do, and I know it's a little bit like gray, is actually write down your own recommendations, right? Send it to people and tell them, can you please add this uh, if it resonates with you? Adjust it, edit it. But it's a lot easier to essentially copy paste the recommendation as opposed to, opposed to sitting down and just writing one, etc. cetera. So uh, a pretty important tip, quote unquote. And then accomplishments. So you just add them here, any publications, uh, patents, courses, projects, anything that you've ever completed or anything that you, you're certified for, et cetera, you can add them here. I really haven't, I'm, I'm not a honorary or like, a, a, like a, a person that's been awarded a lot. I, I do have a couple of accomplishments, but I really just don't feel like they're, you know, they're, they're important to add because most of the eyes, quote unquote, will just end up here. So people will click on my profile, they'll see, uh-huh, growth hacker, 
founder of Inside Insight said, so Inside Insight, people don't even look at your education to be entirely honest. 15K followers, okay, pretty interesting, 500 plus connections. So a pretty well-built profile, featured uh, inside, okay, agency, that, and then they'll click one of these and then they're off, essentially. Nobody, it's very rare for people to scroll down so low to, un unless they're like fishing you out for something. Uh, and then interests, interest, they show up on your profile, but they're pretty useless in my personal opinion, uh, but they do have an effect on what you see on your newsfeed. So if I hadn't uh, been connected with so many people uh, on LinkedIn, what I'd be seeing initially are the interests. So it's essentially a way for LinkedIn to know what to fill up your homepage with, your home feed. Um, and then of course, they also show up on your profile, quote unquote, so right here, uh, interest. And that's essentially it uh, with regards to just building out a profile and the most important elements. Most important elements are the title, okay? So who you are, what you do, etc. Mine can be definitely improved because you'll see growth hacker. Many people are thinking like, okay, what's a growth hacker to begin with? So I could have changed it to uh, growth marketing, right? And then founder of Inside Insight. Again, not the best uh, not the best variation, but I'm not really chasing a lot of that on page SEO. So like on profile SEO, but a better way would be growth hacker and then helping companies, uh, 10 X their deal flow. For example, that's a pretty good way because the title will say exactly what you do. And then the profile will back up your credibility and your ability to do it. Right. So that, that would be essentially one of the best ways. So growth hacker and then helping companies 10 X their deal flow essentially. And then talks about, so you know that it's a creator profile and that's that. Uh, if we view, I think you can view as, as well. So, um, before there used to be a, there used to be a view as section where you can basically view your profile as somebody, uh, as a, as a, as somebody that's not you just to see how it, um, how it resonates. But apparently that, uh, segment I think has been removed and then you can add a couple of sections as well. So additional info, supported languages, etc. any experience, I, most of the stuff that I've covered here. Most important part is essentially this, your cover photo as well. Make sure you add a cover photo because it just adds taste to the profile itself. You can get a, you can get a couple of uh, cover, like cover photos from, I think there's stock ones and then you can edit them in Canva. Um, the profile photo as well. Mine isn't too, too good. Most people have like a, a mug shot, quote unquote, mug shot, like a face shot. Um, but I feel like mine is okay. I've had one that was like way worse, so I, I can't really comment too much on that. Uh, but as per profile optimization, it's about that. Essentially it's, it's, uh, it's uh, advertising something and then just proving the fact that you're able to do it either with thought, like thought leadership based content or anything of that sort. So that's the, um, that's the segment with regards to profile optimization, quote unquote. What is up guys? So uh, in this session, what we're basically gonna be doing is we're gonna be going over the aspect of outreaching through LinkedIn manually, essentially. And the reason as to why I state manually is because you also have the option of outreaching automatically. And you also have the option of outreaching through sponsored in-mail ads, basically where it's a uh, sponsored uh, in-mail campaign, which is set up through the ad manager right here. So if you click on work, advertise, and through that, you're basically able to outreach through the use of LinkedIn ads. But nonetheless, the topic of outreaching manually. So in this case, what we're doing, um, the, the main applications are B2B. So you're selling services, LinkedIn is the place to be. Uh, you're selling to high level executives, LinkedIn is the place to be. You're selling something that's a, it's a high margin B2B product, LinkedIn is definitely the place to be. You're looking to network with other professionals within your industry, again, LinkedIn is definitely the place to be. So first things first, right? How do you identify who you wanna outreach to? So just on the aspect of knowing who's right for your brand, who's right for your product, who's right for your service, who can purchase, etc. In most cases, everything starts off with uh, this search bar right here. Throw, so through this search bar and a little bit of Boolean search, which I'll explain right now, you're basically able to identify people and just create buckets of people that would potentially be interested in purchasing your product 
uh, purchasing your service, hopping on a call to you, etc. So hypothetically speaking, let's say right now, which of course I do, but just for the sake of example as well, let's say I run a marketing agency and I'm looking for people within the finance industry, C-level executives to hop on calls with, to basically secure calls. So in this case, let's say inside insight, our niche is essentially the finance sector. So what I would do uh, just to basically showcase the search as well, is number one, you need to identify which position is relevant and which position you want on calls. Cause it's very easy to just do a, a search on, let's say finance, quote unquote, right? And this would essentially be a rookie mistake, but go on companies, right? And then just go one by one, etc. That's one alternative way, but there's a better way as well. Cause through this way, you're able to target the people who you want to outreach to, right? And essentially just handpick them and send them messages, emails, etc. Of course, personalized in this case, because if you're just copy, if you're just copy pasting essentially a certain template to just a hundred people per day, there's already automated things that exist, like automated solutions that exist on the market. Of course, they do put your profile at risk, just to keep that in mind as well. Um, but the key aspect of manual is personalization because you're able to personalize the message and essentially increase the efficiency of your messages. So the, the, the catch is the following. Hypothetically speaking, if you send 50 personalized messages, the result of them should essentially be bigger as opposed to sending 200 cookie cutter messages, quote unquote. So how do we do it? Let's see with the previous example that I set forward. Uh, we're outreaching to CEOs of the finance uh, industry so that we can sell them marketing uh, services. So in this case, we do a Boolean search, uh, so CEO. So basically what this means is we want the title to basically include CEO in it. And we can also add or founder or uh, owner, owner in this case. So boolean search right and linkedin search bar is a boolean activated one basically means that we're searching for ceos or founders or owners right within so you just want to apply a second filter here uh and a third as well location wise within industry financial services so in this case what we have are worldwide results of ceos or founders or owners right uh worldwide uh, from the financial service industry, essentially. So let's say this individual, financial service, capital, etc. this individual, crypto related, so on and so forth. So that's the first step, essentially, when you're doing a manual outreach. It's essentially developing this list, right? And basically outreaching to them. Now, as per LinkedIn, uh, there's a limit in place and uh, it takes a bit of just uh, playing around to basically understand it. Uh, LinkedIn essentially has... 767,000 results for the allocated search term that I've inputted right now. However, uh, just to protect its database, uh, LinkedIn will only show you 2.5K, if I'm not mistaken, or 1,000. LinkedIn will only show you 1,000 through basic search. It won't show you more. So you'd have to differentiate the search a little bit further uh, to basically find more results. In that case, just a, a pretty important thing to know because you'll see 767,000 results and you'll be like, oh, wow. Uh, but in reality, you're only being exposed to a thousand results, essentially. One of the main reasons as to why they do this is to essentially protect themselves from just massive data scrapers. Uh, and you'll see a couple of like news reports being released saying that LinkedIn's data was leaked, etc. This is just a countermeasure that they have in place in order to protect themselves from such data leaks and just mass scrapers because uh, people have a tendency to essentially just code out uh, scrapers and scripts that essentially just pull all the results, save them in CSVs, Excels, etc. And uh, this basically gives them the ability to manipulate the data to a higher extent, right? As opposed to just having it right here, because then they can do automated outreaches. They can enrich the data through tools like Hunter, Clearbit, etc. Uh, to protect themselves, they'll only expose you to a thousand results. On Sales Navigator, they'll expose you to 2,500, essentially 2.5K. Uh, per search, which I'll showcase in the upcoming session for Sales Navigator. But generally speaking, they'll just showcase 1000. But essentially, that's that. An important thing to also do um, whenever you're outreaching manually is first and foremost, um, select the location, essentially, because it, it's it's one of the, the key differentiators, one of the key tactics that you can do in order to break down the results and have a more 
a forked outreach as opposed to just, you know, a thousand results worldwide is target people by geolocation, essentially. Um, let's say targeting people in the US because they might have more purchasing power, etc. They deal with the dollar, etc. as opposed to, and I have no problem with India, but as opposed to targeting a company in India where a 2.5K um, monthly retainer might be too much for them, essentially. So just keep that in mind and choose your locations in relation to who can purchase and who would have an interest in your service at what point, essentially. So let's do US to begin with. So show results. And then essentially that's the beginning of a manual outreach. We now have 1000 results of people that we can outreach to quote unquote. So let's begin with this profile. Um, so uh, essentially what you would normally do now, you have two options. Uh, you have the option of essentially sending an email. That's number one. And you also have the option of basically sending a connection request with a note. Both options work. Uh, thing is LinkedIn right now has, and my profile hasn't been affected by this yet, but uh, like all profiles are generally just becoming more affected over time. LinkedIn has a, imposed a restriction of where you're basically able to outreach to a hundred people per week as opposed to 700 people per week, which was the limit before. So a hundred per day X seven. Um, and this basically means that it doesn't stop you from manually outreaching. It just basically means that in some cases, uh, you will essentially have to upgrade to a sales nav activated account and also use up your emails, which is something that you can do, but to just kick it off and to showcase. So how I would outreach if I was in your position would be exemplified, uh, example that I mentioned previously, uh, open up the profile. So you also have the ability of, uh, you need to be connected with them to endorse them. You connect, you add a note. So in this case, hey, Gore, uh, uh, would love to have you in my connections. Would, and this is an unpersonalized uh, outreach. I'll showcase uh, more elements of personalization a little bit later on. Um, would love to connect with you. Would love to connect with you. Um, our team helps, let's say, financial service companies. Uh, 10x their deal flow in less than 90 days, in less than 90 days. Um, uh, let's stay in touch, essentially. So that's one way. Let's stay in touch. Now, of course, you can add more personalization. Personalization in this case, and I won't send this connection request through because this isn't an outreach that I'm doing right now. Uh, personalization in this case would essentially mean uh, looking at what the prospect has already done. So uh, just speaking from personal experience. So I run Inside Insight, which is a YouTube channel on growth hacking. I'll give you two examples of people outreaching to me. One example is people just outreaching to me. Hey, founder of Inside Insight, let's hop on a quick call to basically discuss how we can 10x your blah, blah, blah. When I receive these messages for me, it's a cookie cutter message. And as somebody who deals with a lot of lead generation, somebody who understands and deals and sets up a lot of automated outreaches, I see through it in a click my fingers are not working in a click of a in a click of a button at the end of the day it takes like one second for me to essentially see an outreach template and understand okay this has been sent to a thousand other people other people have this sense as well and slowly as more and more people are basically exposed to automated outreaches this spidey sense quote unquote if you may call it that is essentially increasing as a as a whole as a total so when I receive these messages, for me, it's 99% of the time, unless it's, I don't know, Elon Musk outreaching to me with an automated outreach, 99% uh, of the time, it's like, okay, whatever, on to the next one. Like, I probably won't reply. It's probably just a generic outreach. I don't really see how this can essentially benefit me. But uh, because I have the YouTube channel, in many cases, I also receive outreaches saying, hey, Kirill, uh, watched your video for instance, or saw your LinkedIn automate, uh, LinkedIn outreach video, or your, um, saw your video on, uh, WhatsApp automation, for example, that captivates my attention because I've put time and I've put a lot of effort in creating that video and in creating the content essentially. And when people appreciate it, when people state it, right, I already think, okay, this person has researched me. So they've put the effort to basically outreach to me. And immediately the secondary question that basically evolves from this is why, right? So 
Why? What can they offer me? What are they looking to do? Uh, what are they trying to tell me? So in that case, I'll essentially engage in the conversation itself, as opposed to the cookie cutter outreaches, right? Which they could have potentially worked in 2005 or 2014. And I, I know that there was a period when they worked really, really well. Uh, but now it's people are just developing a desensitization, which I just mentioned over and over again to these type of messages. So it's important to be aware of that. And it's important to play into the need for personalization. So in this case, how can we personalize the message for him? First thing on LinkedIn is people post a lot of content on LinkedIn. So it's pretty easy to essentially just see all activity, right? And see if he's posted any articles, see if he's made any posts, see if he's posted any documents, anything of that sort. And to appraise him, I think Nightlight just turned on, to appraise him and show appreciation for what he's posted. So this guy isn't much of a poster, but I think if we do a quick Google search on the name and company name. So his company is um, just remove this uh, revive mental health clinic. So if we head over to YouTube, revive health mental clinic. Still nothing. I think Gore Gore G still nothing, unfortunately, in this case. So there isn't a lot to personalize. Uh, in, in some cases, if people just maintain like a, a, a low level presence online, there might not be a lot to personalize on. So in that case, okay, it makes sense. Just send them a cookie cutter approach if they're actually worthwhile, if they're relevant. But let's look at another profile. So Doug, co-founder at Copper, for instance. Uh, so now he doesn't have to be active DeFi. in the content itself. It's very easy for me to tell, uh, to say, love the copper podcast essentially in that case so uh, love the copper podcast um would love to hop on a quick call to see how we can 10x your deal flow etc in that case he'll know that i watched his company's content and it's not just another one of those cookie cutter approaches it's a lot more personalized in that case so the individual that we're outreaching to doesn't have to be present if they're present in the content if they were present in the production of the podcast etc it's only so much better because they've had a time investment into the content so they're a lot more sensitive to any type of feedback any type of information that you um, the, 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 you basically present with regards to how you felt about the content and the chance of them responding will be higher. But even if, even if they're not present, right, because it's a company activity, a podcast essentially is like a company wide activity. It's, it's the company's mainstream of content marketing at the end of the day, it might not be the mainstream, but it's an active stream. It's an active marketing channel and it represents their content marketing activities. If you can note that out, if you can talk about that that gets a conversation going again. So pretty important stuff. So in this case, um, with Doug, for instance, connect, add a note, don't just send the, an empty invitation, you can and it, there's a it, it's 50 50 as to whether people will accept in some cases, they'll accept because they'll think, okay, this person's just networking, etc. Let's add them see what's up, uh, depending upon how well your profile is optimized. And that's uh, either covered it before or after because I'm filming every video one by one. Um, but if you haven't seen that part, uh, head over to the description and just click on profile optimization and that that segments basically going to cover you uh, guide you over the full aspect of that. But if you send an empty connection request, uh, depending upon how well your profile is optimized and how relevant your profile is to what the other individual is doing within the industry on LinkedIn, uh, etc that basically is going to have an effect on whether people will accept your connection request or not. If your profile's just sub optimized, it's, it's weird. It's it, like, it doesn't make sense. There's no information with regards to who you are, what you're offering, etc. In that case, the chance of them accepting your invitation is pretty low, but if it's well optimized, it's higher. Now, if it's well optimized, it's relevant and you're sending a good connection request message that's personalized as well you're basically looking at a 70 to 80% chance of them accepting your connection request. Now, of course, these numbers are hypothetical, right? But I think it makes sense to you as well. So in this case, uh, based upon the, the fact that we did find their content, it's very easy to essentially say, um, hey, Doug. Now, 
language and formality as well, which is pretty important. Um, you'll have uh, you'll see a couple of messages that are along the lines of "Dear Kirill" or uh, "Hey sir." It's like tone it down. It doesn't have to be so formal. Uh, you can you can approach with a simple "Hey" first name essentially. So, "Hey Doug." Um, It'd be a pleasure to connect. It'd be a pleasure to have you in my network. It'd be a pleasure to have you in my network. Uh, big fan of the Copper podcast on YouTube. On YouTube, that's the personalization line. Um, let's stay in touch. Done. Set. Send. So this is one approach. And I'll I'll, for sh I'll include a couple of outreach templates in the description as a link for you guys to basically have so that you don't come to a point of like writer's block, like what do I send, what do I do? You have like a couple of pre-laid ideas with regards to what you're basically able to send. Um, but there's a couple of different formats through which you can send the initial connection request. You can pitch, again, you can, you can send the empty connection request, no note. Uh, then you can pitch on the initial connection request. If your market isn't oversaturated, right? If you're not offering marketing services, which millions of agencies are offering day by day, and these people are exposed to 10 to 20 different marketing offers on a daily basis. If that's not your industry, then it makes sense. Try, test an outreach of where you basically lay down the service on the initial, me initial message. Makes perfect sense because People aren't, it, it, it all falls down to the point of desensitization. Again, people won't be desensitized to their offer. It's gonna captivate their attention. And if they're actually in need of this service, then sure, let, let's get a conversation up with the vendor. If it's a saturated industry, that's exactly where networking and connecting with people makes you stand out from all other vendors. Because if you have, it, just an example, if I'm aware of the fact that if I need marketing services, right, and I know that there's 200 marketing agencies, who am I more likely to go to? Am I more likely to go to a just random marketing agency that I've never engaged with before? Or am I more likely to go to the marketing agency in which a friend of mine works, right, and in which I already have an established connection, and I also have a, a point of trust at the end of the day. So pretty important to just keep that in mind. So if the industry isn't saturated, test an outreach of where you send of where you send a connection request with a description of the solution that you offer. You can do that as well with a CTA as well of let's hop on a quick call, schedule it here. So <laughs> Calendly and uh, see, see how it goes. If you get uh, calls coming in through that and then you can basically check your metrics and know that for every hundred connection requests you send, you get, let's say five calls then it makes sense. If it's not working, tone it down a little, offer value first. So offer a value first approach where you're offering value upon the initial connection and then give, 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 take. So like as Gary V says, um, if you, I'll, I'll make sure to link some resources of Gary V so that you guys are basically in tune with what I mean. Um, but yeah, so let's stay in touch. And then send. Now, of course, I won't send it because I'm not outreaching. But essentially, that's the, the that's the one of the main things of the manual outreach itself. Now, additionally, if you're outreaching to people that you're already connected with, so let's say you're outreaching to people that are already within your first level of connection request. So in this case, I'll just hop over to my network, uh, 15k connections. So connections. Uh, let's say I'm looking for people within the financial service industry that are already in my connections because I have a pre-established profile. So search with filters, uh, all filters. So filters and the search is like one of the most important things. This is called the basic search. And then of course you have the sales navigator search. Check the timelines below in the description. You'll find the other segment. Um, but in this case, so industry, financial services, and location, because we have 15K connections, I doubt that the sample is gonna be so big, so we'll just keep it worldwide. Uh, show results, 3.2K essentially. So we could expand on it further. Um, so let's say if these people are already in your first connections, you can of course send the message, right? So you have no, uh, you have no limit as to how many uh, characters you input, because on the initial connection request, you have, I think, a 300 character limit, so you need to keep it short and catchy. 
Um, but on the flip side, if people are already connected with you, you can basically just send them a normal message. So you don't need to reconnect with them. What I personally like to do uh, when I connect with people that are already within my connection request circle is I also like to send a message and then endorse. So send them an endorsement as well. When you endorse them, uh, they will also get a notification on the side right here saying Kirill well, Cristalis endorsed you for. And on the flip side, they'll also have a message within messaging basically saying that, well, the offer itself. So, hey, etc. so on and so forth. Um, here you can also see a couple of sponsored campaigns that I'm testing, etc. This is, again, part of the ad, sect ad section. So check in the description below, you'll find the uh, timeline itself. But yeah, so two types, manual, and then you have the manual to second and third degree connections. And then on the flip side as well, you also have uh, f first connections. So people that you've already connected with. Now you also have the ability of basically sending out in mails. So I think that's, uh, it's, particular profiles where this is the email basically it's particular profiles where they have an open email system basically which means that you can email them and you can send a free email so it's a free message as you can see right here and if you click on why it basically explains exactly why now cool thing about emails is as soon as you send them not only will they get a notification on LinkedIn, but they will also get a notification via email. So the email that they have connected to their LinkedIn profile will also receive a notification saying, Kubo Cristalis is reaching out with the following subject, etc." The email is exactly like an email, quote unquote. So uh, I can actually show you a case of an email that I've just been testing myself. It's exactly like an email. So subject and then text. If the subject is spammy, weird, etc., people won't open the message. They'll just delete it uh, like immediately. If it's a attention grabbing subject of quick question, and personally speaking, just from previous results, I've seen that quick question works the best across email and in mail. Um, the chance of them opening it is essentially higher. So you're working for two things whenever you're sending an open in mail. In this case, you're working for open rates. And then of course, you're also working for conversions. If people don't open your message, there won't be no conversions. If people open your message, and the body so the text itself is good as well, you then might have a conversion. So it's like a decreasing percentage, essentially, it's like a pipeline, like throughput, quote, unquote. So um, in this case, uh, let's say if I was outreaching, she does senior to ensure your business growth, senior and executive, so human resource thrive. So quick Q, yeah, my spelling, quick question, dot, dot, dot. And then, hey, uh, first name, Jenny Kirill here from Inside Insight. Uh, let's say it's a podcast outreach, quote unquote. So I don't think she'd be the right person for a podcast outreach, but your Kirill here from Inside Insight uh, would love to have you appear on our podcast, etc. Quick description of what the podcast is, and then CTA. So the CTA would essentially be appear on blah blah blah. The CTA would be uh, feel free to book a time that suits suits you via our Calendly. So. Calendly, and then if you have any additional questions, just message me back, click on my profile, connect with me, etc. So that's the in mail. It's the, the 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 third element of like the sending messages to people within your second and third circle, your first circle, and then the in mail as well. If you're ever hit with the limit, with the new limit that exists right now of the hundred connection uh, issue, quote unquote, that just many people are. Uh, facing as a problem, uh, you basically have the option of the in mails as well. So just switch to those and you essentially have, I think if you have a sales navigator plan, you have an additional either 400 or 800 in mails that you can send per month and then they get replenished. So just use that to your advantage as well. And then you shouldn't have an issue of hitting any limits when you're outreaching on the flip side as well, as per the limit of the hundred connection requests, as per just a, a bunch of webinars that I've attended and an actual company hiring data scientists to uncover who is hit with the 100 connection request limit, if you're doing a manual outreach, the chance of you being hit with a 100 connect, connection request limit is significantly lower because this limit is placed on profiles that have a low connection acceptance rate, which means that 
they're essentially sending irrelevant messages to the wrong target market. If you're sending relevant messages to the right people from the right target market with the right offer and the right value, your connection acceptance rate will essentially be higher. It'll, it'll be higher than, I think the number is either 20 to 25%. If it's higher than 20 to 25%, right, the chances of you having the LinkedIn connection request limit is significantly lower. So if your wording is right, your English is right, you're targeting the right people, chances are you won't even have to send open emails, which you can, of course, it's another option because there's two touch points with that. There's email and LinkedIn as well. Uh, but it's uh, it's just something to essentially be aware of just from the, the, the manual outreach aspect itself. But essentially, yeah, uh, that's about that from the manual outreach aspect. Many people like to export a, a search. So in this case, they'll export this full search and they'll include it on an Excel sheet and then they'll enrich that Excel sheet with additional like emails, phone numbers, etc., just for a multi-touch uh, outreach. Um, but the basic of it just for outreaching is essentially this and it's highly possible, super easy. And uh, just make sure to personalize. Otherwise, there's there's essentially no point of doing a manual outreach to begin with because there's solutions on the market for as little as $8 per month that can just start, you know, uh, like bombarding like people's inboxes with connection requests, etc. So just make sure to personalize, make sure to research them and find information about them and then outreach. One of the strategies that I'm aware of that people like to use whenever they're doing personalization based campaigns is they'll prep an Excel sheet. So like a Google sheet or an Excel sheet first with the profiles, the names and the companies. And then they'll include a additional uh, row saying personalization. And they'll fill out that row before they even begin outreaching, before they even touch LinkedIn. And then what they do once that's ready or once they've hired somebody that's completed the personalization job, so just researching people and getting that done, is they'll essentially just copy paste and then just outreach with a personalized message through that. So it's it's the uh, just uh, the, the quote unquote more, more scalable way of doing it with a VA, so a virtual assistant that you can hire on like Upwork and Fiverr and uh, whilst at the same time maintaining the aspect of personalization. So that's definitely a, another option as well. But all in all, that's about that, um, just for the aspect of uh, manual outreach through basic. Um, and yeah. So uh, next up, we essentially have LinkedIn Sales Navigator. So. If you remember the segment that I released on uh, basic search and manual outreaches in general, and for all those that haven't watched that segment, it's available in the description. There's timestamps for the whole course guide. Again, I don't know what to call it, uh, but everything is there with all the elements and uh, essentially all the segments of the video itself. But if you remember the manual outreach segment that I recorded, uh, I basically showed how to use basic search in order to outreach to individuals, whether you're doing it manually, some might be doing it automatically, etc. Regardless, uh, in addition to basic search, LinkedIn also offers a more advanced system through which you can search essentially search and outreach from in the first place. Sales Navigator is a tool that's made for sales specialists, business developers, etc. And one of the key reasons as to why it stands out is because it gives individuals access to all the information that LinkedIn has upon its demographic. So not all, of course, they, they, there might be like additional information that's not released, but it gives you a lot more information as opposed to the basic search and the basic filters. So if you look at the basic filters, uh, let's just do a random search. You can see that you are uh, limited on people and there's a company search as well, but we'll focus primarily on the people one. Uh, okay, let's try again. So CEO, for example, and then people you can see that the the uh, factors and the filters through which you can search are the following. So location, current company, past company, uh, school, industry, profile language, and then service categories. Sales Navigator offers a lot more. So on Sales Navigator, you could do an account search or a lead search. And the search that we're doing right here is a lead search because lead search, if I'm not mistaken, basically targets people. So we'll name this uh, test YouTube. And then as a description, we'll also enter test YouTube, create. And then within this list, we can basically do a more in-depth search of whatever we're looking for. So 
the key segments of the filters that are become enabled whenever you do a sales navigator search are essentially the fact that you can target people that are within groups. That's number one. Uh, you can target people that have posted content that contains a keyword, essentially, that you indicate that you're looking for within Sales Navigator. This is important because you can then do a relevance-based outreach where you're basically outreaching to people who have included growth hacking or lead generation within their content before. So it's it's another angle through which you can basically, quote unquote, attack with your lead generation efforts. In addition to that, the most important one, and this is on the accounts list, as far as I know. So if we search for... Uh, Let's say we're doing a search for crypto in this case. So crypto, they also have the technology used, if I'm not mistaken, or they might've removed that. Um, so lead filters, account filters. So account filters also has technologies used. Technologies used is a pretty important filter because if you're doing, uh, let's say, if you run a Shopify competitor, so you run a uh, competitor to Shopify that basically helps businesses create a uh, quote unquote, I don't know, e-commerce stores in an easy, no code, low code manner. One of the outreaches that you can do is you can basically target businesses built on Shopify by just doing a quick search. In this case, also removing crypto as a keyword and including fashion, cause that would be more relevant. Uh, within the United States, for example, industry, you can leave that alone. And then um, essentially do a quick search. So these 918 results, as per LinkedIn, all use Shopify. So it's pretty important when you're in the SaaS business, when you're in the tech business, when you, you, you have an app, essentially, and what you want to do is outreach to individuals that are using a relevant app. And one of the one of the best ways to which you can basically get a customer base is by lowballing the pricing of the existing app. So one outreach that I would do if I was running a Shopify competitor is basically uh, an outreach to the individuals of these companies saying, hey, uh, I noticed your business is using Shopify. We have a solution that does the exact same thing, but at a lesser price. And to be honest, it does more. So if you're able to structure your outreach in that way, it from a comparison standpoint, right? Because they're already using Shopify, it's easy for them to say, uh-huh, okay, makes sense. The fact that it's priced less, right? So it can decrease their, their, their monthly cost. And the fact that it offers more, that becomes like a point of intrigue at the end of the day. It captures the interest of the prospect and then they essentially seek more information. So that's one alternative and uh, that, that's one use case to be entirely honest. Additional filters. So we'll just progress with account lists. Now again, account lists, whenever you're searching for accounts, you're essentially searching for companies. So let's uh, also look for, we'll do a quick finance search. So additional filters that are pretty interesting. And these are filters that Sales Navigator offers, but basic search doesn't offer at the end of the day. These are lead filters. In this case, we need account filters are revenue counts. So if you're outreaching, if you're only dealing with a uh, with a co with companies that have a certain uh, revenue level, so like an annual revenue level, uh, this targeting this section of the uh, of the filters is essentially key. Basically, the annual revenue allows you to target companies that have a certain revenue. Industry as well, it's pretty much the exact same thing as. Uh, as the basic search. So LinkedIn has a list of 60 or 70 industries, which they update year by year. And you're basically able to target companies uh, from an industry perspective. Company headcount growth. This filter basically tells you how the, the growth, I think it's the growth of employees that they're hiring essentially. So the, the, the total growth of how many people they're hiring over certain months, essentially. And then company headcount, this is pretty important because Company headcount and annual revenue are interrelated because if a company has, let's say, 2,000 employees, unless they're like an MLM, right? Uh, there's certain uh, there's certain costs associated with that from a human resource standpoint. So, if annual revenue isn't the filter that's giving you the results that you're looking for with regards to just bettering the targeting of the companies that you're outreaching to, company headcount is an alternative solution. So you know that if a company has 1,000 to 5,000 employees, it's pretty easy to assume that there is a relation with regards to the company's annual revenue as well, just in case if annual revenue is working for you. Fortune, uh, I think this is just, it's different lists of like the, the top 500 companies, etc. I'm not too well versed on what exactly that is. Um, 
But my favorite filters, give or take, are essentially the, of course, the industry one, because regardless of whether it's basic or sales enough, it plays an important role. Uh, so we can actually remove keywords and then we can do an industry search of accounting um, with a company headcount of 200 to 500 employees. And then technologies used, we could do, let's see what they have. Uh, so Google Universal Analytics, for example. And then you could basically do an outreach telling them that you have a different analytics solution, for example. So that's, uh, that's another thing. So again, main thing with regards to Sales Navigator is essentially the lead results and the um, account results. So lead results, it gives you access to individuals of companies and then account results basically gives you companies as well. Now you can do a lot. Uh, you can save searches on Sales Navigator. Uh, you can even set up alerts so that when new people are added into a certain demographic, uh, you're basically alerted that there's a new result that you can outreach to, etc. But the baseline of it is pretty simple. It's uh, it, it even acts as a CRM to be entirely honest. So you can essentially add notes uh, directly into Sales Navigator. Uh, so right here, and um, you can essentially outreach to them directly through Sales Nav. So you can send a message. This is uh, one of the emails that I have remaining. So. Through SalesNav, you're given X number of free emails, as far as I've understood. And with these emails, you could basically do an outreach. And then I think you can actually purchase new emails uh, separately, or they get replenished month by month. And then highlights, etc., and recent activity, any changes, so on and so forth. There's also a segment on Sales Navigator where you're basically told how to best reach them your best path in. So your best path in, what it does is it highlights, I think we can find, uh, cause this is a third connection. If we find somebody on the second connection level, it's like this individual, it's gonna tell us that my best path in to this individual is by connecting with this individual, right? Asking for an intro. And again, it's an email, etc., cetera. And uh, essentially asking for a reference or recommendation to this individual. So it's uh, like, quote unquote, social hacking. It just gives you a perspective with regards to your best path in, quote unquote, but yeah, uh, pretty cool stuff. And then essentially experience, uh, education. So just like the the, the plain um, LinkedIn profile itself. And then if you click on this and you type on, uh, you click on view on linkedin.com, it basically redirects you to the individual's profile to basically take you off sales navigator. And then here you have your lead lists. Now, again, personally speaking, I don't use sales nav a lot. I primarily use the basic one because it's a, it's a much more it just, it's more simpler and the outreaches that I do right now are primarily either manual or sponsored in mail. So I don't necessarily do a lot of manual outreach for us from Sales Navigator. Sales Navigator is a nice to have nonetheless, um, but essentially, yeah, pretty simple, uh, pretty, pretty simple. And the cost, uh, I think it costs what, 75 euros per month. And on the aspect of whether it's worth it or not, I personally think it's worth it. It used to be really worth it uh, for, add-ons and tools, which I explain further, just check the description for the, uh, the timestamp itself of the add-on section. It used to be worth it for several add-ons, like uh, for data extraction, email enrichment, etc. But slowly as LinkedIn's countermeasures basically grow on these things, and you see a lot of more profiles get banned and banned, uh, people are slowly minimizing their use of those, which is good because uh, they're starting to use um, LinkedIn in a better way. One of the cool things about uh, Sales Navigator is your social selling index. So this segment right here, which basically showcases your profile's rank within LinkedIn as a whole. So in this case, you can see that my social selling index basically is 61 out of 100. So it's telling me that, you know, I have the, I have space to improve. I don't really look at this, but I remember one time I was on a call and somebody just referred me to the stat and they're like, etc. So I found it pretty interesting. Referrals, this seems like a new thing, but uh, apparently you can give two free months of Sales Navigator via LinkedIn message. So that's pretty interesting. So you can actually refer people to Sales Nav for free. Good tool, definitely. It uh, gives you a lot more access with regards to the, the backend of LinkedIn and all the data that they basically have. My favorite, again, my favorite filters are uh, tech used and then company headcount as well. And additionally, uh, if you revert back to the manual outreach segment, it's in the description. One of the key things with regards to sales nav and if you're outreaching a lot or if you're doing whatever, is that basic will give you a thousand search results where sales nav will give you 2.5K. So if we do a lead search right here on, let's say again, CEO, and then we'll do industry 
uh, accounting, for example. And then location, we'll keep it broad, set. It tells us that there's 120,000 results, but uh, LinkedIn will essentially only expose us to 2.5K on SalesNav. I'm not sure if they changed the number, but that's the, that's the number that we had before. If we count all the, all the, uh, the rows themselves, they should be 25. Additionally, one of, the, uh, one of the cool things with regards to SalesNav is one of my favorites. So there's a lot of dormant profiles on LinkedIn, which is normal. You have this with any social media platform. But by selecting this criteria right here, 6.5K posted on LinkedIn in the past 30 days, you're basically selecting the most active profiles on LinkedIn within the past 30 days. You can close to guarantee that these profiles check their profile, they check their messages, and they engage as well. So for utmost results for your manual automated or sponsored outreach, the best way to essentially outreach to them is by selecting this criteria right here because you're outreaching to the most active people within a certain time frame, as opposed to 120K results, right? Which last time they could have checked LinkedIn was let's say two or three months ago. So pretty important thing to note. Also, and additionally, one of the final things is that when you do send an in-mail, so if you click on one of the individuals here and then you click on message and you send them an in-mail, and it's one of the things with regards to emails, which I mentioned in the manual outreach segment as well. Um, all emails also uh, trigger an email notification as well. So not only will they receive a notification on their LinkedIn inbox, so right here on messaging, but they will also receive a email notification. So it's more of a two touch approach as opposed to a one touch because the more platforms that you can essentially touch a person on whenever you're outreaching, the higher the chance of their attention being drawn to the uh, segment itself. So by doing this, you're essentially increasing the chance of a response of engagement, etc. So that's one of the cool things with regards to in mails. But uh, alternatively, because we also filmed the LinkedIn ad section, whenever you do a sponsored in mail campaign, um, I don't think you receive an email, but I'll have to double check that just to be 100% sure if you do, that's pretty cool, but I'm not 100% sure with regards to that. But essentially, yeah, um, uh, sales nav is pretty simple. So um, next up, we have a segment which a couple of you might be pretty amazed that I've actually like made it a segment of the video, but I think it's a uh, pretty important and up and coming pretty important up and coming feature of LinkedIn. So it's LinkedIn events. Uh, LinkedIn events have been there for quite some time right now. If I'm not mistaken, they've been around. I think they might have even been around like for the past year and a half to two years. I'm not like too sure on whether it's a, a feature that was added recently, but the effectiveness of this feature when used correctly um, is pretty worthwhile at the end of the day. I've run some uh, tests myself in the past uh, with a partner of mine where we did a partnered webinar uh, just on the topic of B2B lead generation, B2B outreaches, etc. And the results were pretty okay. Um, there's a couple of other adaptations that I've basically thought out uh, across the way, uh, like pairing up a LinkedIn event with LinkedIn Live, for example, and LinkedIn Live is something that I'll cover uh, it's in the upcoming topic. So just if you want to watch it, check the description timeline, you'll see the uh, LinkedIn live segment right there. Um, but it's, um, it, it's, it's definitely a, a, an aspect of LinkedIn that's worthwhile mentioning. So if we hop over to my screen right here, uh, here you can actually see that just by searching for business, uh, you can basically come across give or take 8.9K 8, 8 events, essentially. And these are upcoming events. So this one is tomorrow, Friday, etc. And if we open up right here, so Boss Women's Mixer and Celebration, so event by, so that's who's actually creating the event itself. Uh, how many attendees are joining the event? And then here you can attend the event or etc. And then I think it also opens up a chat room, if I'm not mistaken. So normally it should. Uh, this one doesn't registration. So redirects to Eventbrite. That's the CTA itself. Um, so you can host two types of events. You can host an event that's LinkedIn native with a LinkedIn live session where you basically host it on LinkedIn, which is the best way to essentially host a LinkedIn event because there's um, a rule in marketing, which basically says never drive traffic off the platform. So if somebody's on LinkedIn, sell to them on LinkedIn. If somebody's on Facebook, sell to them on Facebook. Don't have them hop from LinkedIn to Facebook, to Zoom, to Calendly, etc. It just complicates the whole process and naturally you'll have a drop off rate. So let's say if 
by doing a LinkedIn event and having a LinkedIn Live, uh, you're gonna have a 50% attendance rate. By redirecting people to a Zoom session, right, this attendance rate of 50% will just naturally drop off to 10 to 15 because it overcomplicates the process. Some people won't be up for it. They'll RSVP, but when the time comes, they might not use Zoom. They might um, they might not have it installed, etc. So it's a lot easier and a lot better from a marketing perspective to sell to the prospect at the spot of where they are at the moment. So if they're on LinkedIn, do it on LinkedIn, essentially. Um, so those are the, uh, the, the, the two types and um, it's pretty simple. So just to guide you over the event creation process. So I'll actually show you one of the latest events that I had myself. Uh, it wasn't this one, this was a draft, it was this one. Um, and then I'll guide you over the, uh, the, the, the creation itself. But essentially, yeah. So Every event, of course, has a title, right? So keeping our calendars full. This was the second event of this type that we did. Uh, here you can see the attendees as well. So this event had 247 attendees, out of which, give or take, 10 to 15% attended. So we had an attendance of approximately 25 to 30 attendees. Reason as to why it was so low was because we did the mistake of driving people onto a Zoom session as opposed to doing a LinkedIn Live. So let's say using StreamYard with two people having a second person join on their own computer and me joining as well, and then running it through StreamYard on LinkedIn where the conversions would have been significantly better at the end of the day. Uh, we did the mistake of driving people to a Zoom, which of course you live, you learn, quote unquote. So in this case, right, uh, it tells you where it is. So you can select whether it's online or whether it's in person. Um, this also tells you the date as well, so when it's happening. And then join here, as you can see, our, C our CTA, our call to action was a Zoom room. So again, that's that. Then if you click on this, you can see the attendees of the event. You can outreach to them, do a manual outreach, etc. And then the event chat as well. So the event chat is basically a chat room that uh, opens up right here, as you can see. And um, this chat room is basically a group chat just for event attendees. So only they have access to it. If they wanna opt in, they click on chat and then they're in essentially. And here you can post updates. Not so many people join. Uh, you could say that 10% of all attendees are bound to join the group chat itself. Uh, but it's another touch point, quote unquote, just to, 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 to mark it with and mark it to. Um, you can create a poll as well. And then here you can basically post updates. So in this case, Christianas was posting the updates. Uh, we ran the webinar together. And the um, most important thing with regards to events and why I like events so much is because you have attendee registrations. Um, if I click on download, what this is going to give me is it's going to give me a CSV of 260, 245 emails or 247, whatever emails of all the attendees and whether they uh, mentioned that I can remarket to them by email or not, quote unquote. I just won't do it on this video because I don't want to disclose uh, people's details, but it's a pretty important thing because this essentially means that even if the event doesn't work out, you still have an additional 250 emails that you can market to. So if you plug that into Snov, if you plug that into Active Campaign, any emailing software that you essentially use, uh, these are contact details of qualified people that have engaged with your brand before that you can market to. And it's pretty important at the end of the day because people will go uh, above and beyond to basically capture people's emails. But to capture 250 emails from an event of people that have attended the event, engaged with your brand before, that's something, especially in B2B where one deal can essentially make or break a month, especially if it's high margin. So it's definitely something to consider. Um, the way I like to see it is essentially replicating the Clubhouse strategy because Clubhouse was a, it's an audio only social media platform, but my time on Clubhouse basically showed me the importance of speaking, of creating content, of just being in your prospect's face 24 seven, regardless of uh, the way I said it is like, <laughs> just being in your prospect's face 24 seven, having them be exposed to your content, hearing your voice, seeing you, et cetera. Just, it, it's, it, it's, it's crazy the amount of results that it can essentially have on your business, regardless of whether you're in services, whether you're in e-commerce, et cetera. Developing a thought leadership position the the results that come from that are it, it's even better than a paid ad campaign quote unquote because uh this creating content hosting events etc sure there's a time investment but 
the in in some cases the results coming from it are like hockey stick growth as opposed to let's say just running a paid ad campaign where you know what the results are going to be and depending upon your ad spend you're going to have x result quote unquote so in that case so I'm, I'm essentially a big proponent of this strategy as a whole and of course running linkedin events so pretty simple now the key thing with regards to linkedin events and this is one of the most important parts as to why i like them because of how easy it is to bring traffic to them is the following so let me just open up another one i think it's this one if i'm not mistaken no is how easy it is to essentially invite people to your linkedin event so if we find my previous events should be growth hacking lead generation etc if we click on invite right you'll notice that you can essentially and this is it's major not a lot of people talk about this everybody's focused on the 100 the connection per week limit but this is major this essentially means that you can you can invite up to a thousand people per week to your linkedin event quote unquote and if the event is relevant you can expect a 25 percent uh, rsvp rate so 25 percent 250 people should essentially rsvp per week if your event is relevant if the people that you're connecting with have engaged with your brand before and they're relevant the chance of them rsvping is significantly higher now as a growth hacker again um i like to just accelerate the process and automate it so usually what we'll do is if you just scroll down and this is a, a bit of a a growth hack i'm not sure if uh, it's uh, they'll probably patch this especially if this video gets big but how do you do it so click on in the of course you click on industries you'll choose everybody in marketing and advertising and then as soon as you select a filter you can basically mass select and it selects 50 at a time now if you scroll down let's choose you as well if you scroll down to the bottom and you keep holding page down it's just gonna keep on scrolling essentially until it gets all the results so right now i'm selecting all people that are within the marketing and advertising industry and i'm just holding page down with my finger quote unquote so uh, i'm not doing anything major and then if i select these this essentially selects 225 people at once if i invite all of them that's a notification for 225 people telling 225 people that i've invited them to my event if i hold uh if i deselect and then if i hold page down longer Yeah, if I just hold page down longer, then the selection rate essentially increases. So I'm able to, it's pretty stupid. <laughs> you can code something out that does this. Uh, but if you just hold your finger down and page down for like three minutes, you can essentially just select a thousand people. And that's it. That's a thousand people invited to your event for like, I don't know, quote unquote, three minutes of work. So select, that's an additional 425. So 50% of the credits have essentially been done. Of course, on the flip side, you can also invite people thoughtfully, manually, etc. But one of the ways through which you can do it is essentially that. So it's it's super easy to invite people to your LinkedIn event. One of the assumptions that I have, and one of the, of course, the my hypothesis is the one that I mentioned uh, previously, which is that if you host the event through LinkedIn Live directly on LinkedIn, your attendance rate should essentially be higher. So that's one of the things that i'll be testing out in the future and then if you want to learn about linkedin life setting it up etc check the description it's in the timeline the chapters of this full guide itself full course etc so pretty easy to invite people then you just click on invite and then let's say the invites go out now in this case should we do it fuck it let's do it so invite 425 and then it essentially just sends the invitation to 425 people i'm not sure why this didn't work now so invite did it work okay 400 people 425 people invited to the event so that's one way with this event what i'm doing is i'm partially attempting to gain the system by inviting people to the event and it's an event in the future and then if they click on the call to action the cta it redirects them to one of my telegram communities so kirillon growth hacking which is sort of working at the same time it isn't like you can see that there's not a lot of attendees here because i didn't set up the event i didn't put a cover photo etc um, but it's just another test that I was doing. So I run a lot of these like tests. In some case, they're stupid. In some case, they make a lot of sense. In some case, like they get like crazy results. Uh, but it's just essentially something that I always do. Just test a lot of things. Um, now to set up an event, and um, there's one segment here that's super important. So if you head over to, again, events, I keep on losing it. Um, 
events you click on plus create an event so in this case there's one segment that's just super important that you don't want to miss out on so test event for youtube youtube time zone etc when you want to have it a uh, start date start time end date description etc speakers who you want to have as a speaker so in this case we'll invite ourselves visibility public event registration or broadcast link uh description there's a linkedin uh lead gen form basically so test event this is a test event for the youtube video make sure to also like head over to canva spend some time on like a proper cover photo make sure that it it captivates the eye and it also just describes what the event is about put a cover photo uh, profile photo as well for the event something simple uh speakers and then registration or broadcast link does it create it did set okay discard so it seems to be automatic basically as soon as you create an event uh you there isn't an option but as soon as you create an event there is a linkedin lead gem form which is this one and if you download it it's going to give you the the data and the emails of the people that opted in so you can use this as a custom audience for ads you can use this as a audience to email you can uh, there's another growth hack as well you can essentially use the emails and upload them uh through csv i'm not sure if this still works i think it does uh through a so if you go over to my network you can upload the individuals so it's right here add personal contacts so more options and then you should have upload email and then you can upload the email database of the people and send them an, a connection request immediately so all done automatically that's another growth hack i think linkedin will patch it soon uh but that's another option as well but yeah uh, events are definitely a thing very very easy to invite people and i think the limit increases from a thousand to two thousand if you have two speakers or three thousand if you have three speakers so the more speakers you have the more invitations you can send now you can also run ads to your linkedin event so if you're setting up a linkedin event uh if you head over to the ad network so just to showcase it super briefly i won't head over into the uh the ad segment right now there is an ad segment in this video but i won't be showcasing it at the moment uh so let's head over to inside inside campaigns do we have any ads running everything's paused set so um if you create a new campaign uh next and then add so website visits you can essentially create an event ad so it's this segment right here and basically driving traffic to your ad you can do a manual outreach of course as well automated outreach at your own risk um but essentially yeah briefly put so events definitely use them uh, especially if you're looking to 10x your content marketing game and your target market is b2b c-level exec executives etc it's definitely a thing to consider so that's this segment and uh, on to the next one so um next up we have the aspect and the topic of linkedin groups now this session so this segment is going to be pretty short and the reason as to why it's going to be pretty short is because linkedin groups uh do still remain as a fundamental part of linkedin and it, it is a it is a segment of linkedin that's definitely worth mentioning um but the main issue with linkedin groups is that the general engagement within groups as opposed to the engagement that you can get by posting content on your profile it's significantly less uh, as opposed to other social media platforms and what i mean by this is the following um if you run let's say a facebook group for instance generally speaking facebook groups can actually perform relatively well uh, I there's there's a lot of groups out there with hundreds of thousands of members and just uh, a pretty like adequate sense of daily engagement happening on a daily basis uh whatsapp groups as well they also perform well primarily not not because there's a home feed that exposes exactly what's happening within the group but uh because you get a pretty personalized notification with that whenever anybody uh posts a new message etc so it becomes a habit to essentially check the group every once in a while um but linkedin groups uh, apart from one of the outreach methods which i'm going to showcase right now they 
aren't really that good, to be entirely honest. Now, I might be mistaken to a certain extent. There might be some LinkedIn groups that are like absolutely killing it. But as far as I'm aware, they don't necessarily perform too well. The reason as to why LinkedIn groups haven't become such a big fundamental thing of LinkedIn, uh, other than just collecting a certain target market within a certain uh, within a certain group or within a certain uh, collection, quote unquote, is because groups don't show up on the home feed, essentially. So whenever people uh, open up LinkedIn, whether it's on their phone, whether it's on whatever, they need to manually hop over to LinkedIn and join a certain group and open it up every single time. The updates from a certain group don't cross over to your home feed. So the basic page essentially whenever you open up LinkedIn is essentially the home feed. Now, because there never are any group updates within the home feed other than just other people's content, ads, etc., polls, so on and so forth, um, it, it becomes pretty easy to essentially just forget about the groups. A couple of groups that I'm part of, for instance, uh, this one, I think I'm a manager of this group. We've had it for quite some time. A um, couple of posts here and there, but again, none of these posts uh, get reflected onto the home feed. So it essentially becomes content that's just posted in the background that you forget about. But on the flip side, um, one of the cool things about pre-established groups is that if a group is about a certain interest or about a certain business practice, for instance, like this one is franchise owner, franchisee and entrepreneurs. What they offer is an additional targeting option that LinkedIn's search bar, basic or sales navigator search doesn't offer. It's pretty hard to, as far as I know, it's pretty hard to search for franchise owners uh, and franchisee based entrepreneurs uh, through LinkedIn search simply because there isn't a criteria upon which you can place the search on in the first place. Uh, you can't, there is no industry that's franchise. Uh, you can't segment by businesses that are franchises, right? So the only way through which you'd be able to target them is primarily through a group, essentially. The, so uh, apart from the, the ability to outreach manually to individuals within this group, so if we click on members, CEO, uh, if we click on members, right? Apart from the ability to outreach manually to them, there are of course uh, automated solutions right now, which of course do put your account at risk. It is against the terms and conditions of uh, LinkedIn, but I just thought it'd be worth mentioning, especially in this video, because we're covering everything from like a army approach of like what's available from a full scale. So it'd be, um, I think it'd be wrong of me not to mention that possibility. Now, what these automated, uh, what these automated messages do, uh, autom automations, quote unquote, do, is they'll essentially collect all the group members. And as you can see, uh, despite the fact that these individuals are within our third network of connections or third circle, uh, you can still send them a direct message, essentially. Now, the main drawback uh, with regards to this message, right, despite the fact that it's easy to message them, is that these messages still fall into your message requests. So they don't fall into your, uh, they don't fall into your, okay, so this is new. They don't fall into your immediate, uh, into your immediate inbox. So an example of this would be, now, of course, you have the sales navigator inbox, which I'll cover in the upcoming segment itself. For all the segments, just check the description in the bottom. Um, message request inbox, but these messages fall into message request inbox. So let's say this message that we got right here from Abhishek uh, via lead generation group. So that means that we're from the same group, just like an email, but the subject line is via which group. Uh, hey, Kirill, saw you in the LinkedIn lead gen group. Just curious, are you using to scale? So if I accept, I can basically message them back. If I decline, it quote unquote just moves to my spam essentially. So if I accept, it then becomes a normal conversation. Uh, you can engage, connect with them, so on and so forth. If I decline, it just essentially disappears. So the, in my personal opinion, the best thing about the groups is that you can essentially just create a certain target market of people that you wouldn't be able to find uh, otherwise through basic search, through sales navigator search, etc. And it uh, it makes sense, especially in uh, just niche target markets. Let's say if you're um, offering services to people in cryptocurrency, for example, because again, if you go on search, if you type in uh, CEO, quote unquote, you lack an industry that is related to crypto. So if you go on all filters, um, let's see, so industry, you might be able to find it on the service aspect, but uh, let's say crypto. 
crypto no nothing so no no industry related to cryptocurrencies uh, but you can do a CEO and again this is reference to the boolean search CEO and cryptocurrency but in some cases people might not mention cryptocurrency within their job title or their title because this is pulling um, searches that include both CEO and cryptocurrency within the title of the profile itself now you still get some pretty adequate results 18k but you you'll still be limited with like uh potential connection limitations etc so it's easier to essentially find them in a group send them a message request and then outreach to them so again just super good for creating these small buckets of target markets pretty bad for just overall engagement if you're looking to create a community somewhere linkedin honestly speaking isn't the platform to do so um i would suggest like create your own discourse forum create your own facebook group your own whatsapp group uh, essentially th there's a million of like just better platforms out there to host groups uh, just from personal experience and i'm i'm somebody that runs maybe six plus communities across a wide array of platforms telegram whatsapp facebook discourse as well so a discourse forum for inside insight and uh, that are I never ran a Discord, uh, but yeah. And the one that performs best, in my personal opinion, is Discourse and WhatsApp. Um, but uh, LinkedIn, uh, despite the fact that I've tried to start a couple of groups and I've, I've managed a couple as well, it really isn't the place to be. I wanna see if uh, this new services, uh, service categories thing here provides anything. So crypto, still. So even on services, it seems like you can't really pull up anything that's crypto related because the service doesn't come up essentially. But yeah, that's it with regards to groups. Did I miss anything with regards to potential? Uh, block? Yeah, essentially that's that. So uh, that's that and uh, on to the next one. Next up, we have LinkedIn content marketing. Now, LinkedIn content marketing is probably one of the most important modules of this entire like video series slash course guide. Uh, and it basically showcases exactly how you're able to market your profile, your services, your, your website, your, your landing page organically. Um, there's a lot of options, but every now and then, uh, LinkedIn basically has one option upon which they capitalize on. So they always have, uh, let's say, one option that's most favored by the algorithm throughout a series of several months. Prior to the option that we have right now, which I'll get into a little bit further, um, the most favored post, essentially, or the most favored like uh, variation of a post that you could have was essentially a LinkedIn video. Uh, the LinkedIn video basically allowed you to essentially record the video. I think it was up to five minutes. Uh, posted directly on your profile and then this would uh, essentially just it would have an accelerated reach from an algorithm perspective so LinkedIn will always showcase how many views you get per post and who's viewing your posts as well and a couple of months ago if you were to post a video you would just slowly come to realize that videos are the most boosted posts on LinkedIn at the moment, the most boosted post on LinkedIn, just from an algorithmic perspective, are LinkedIn polls. And if you hop over to my screen right here, you'll see that uh, most of the polls on the home feed itself are essentially LinkedIn polls. So this one, scary, ta -ta, you vote, etc. it captures your vote. Then if the creator of the post itself clicks on the votes, they basically have access to everybody that voted, what they voted, etc. which could essentially assist with outreach as well. So that's one variation. Here's another one. You'll just keep seeing them pop up all over. A while back ago, um, it was different. So it was videos. Right now it's polls. Uh, by the time you're probably seeing this video, it might not be polls. It might be something else. But the key concept that I want you to grasp from this section is that LinkedIn usually has one content format that they prioritize over the others, essentially. So in this case, it's polls. Prior to that, it was videos. I'm guessing, potentially speaking, that in the future, it could be LinkedIn Live, uh, just so that LinkedIn basically incentivizes content makers to broadcast their own content on LinkedIn as a platform, as opposed to driving people off the platform. So onto Zoom, et cetera, because these are partially antagonistic companies, right? That 
it's not within LinkedIn's interest to basically drive traffic to them. So it's important to keep that in mind and always look for the content format that's most appreciated by the platform itself. Instagram even has the exact same thing, to be entirely honest. Instagram, uh, Instagram's currently most favorite content format is uh, Reels, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the same thing for YouTube as well. So YouTube Shorts uh, are YouTube's favorite content format at the given moment because they're in competition with TikTok. So it makes sense for them to basically promote this post type so as to avoid having people go over to TikTok, essentially. So it's in most cases, it's strategic. It's business related as well, uh, but it's an important thing to keep an eye on. So on the aspect of polls, if you actually hop over to my profile right here, uh, you'll notice that most of the uh, most of my activity right now is poll related because it is the it is the most boosted uh, it is the most boosted form of content at the given moment. Throughout a period as well, it was documents. So documents were pretty boosted. I did a couple of tests just to see how they perform. And if we just look at some of the metrics from my posts, uh, this will essentially serve as a, a pretty good like base ground for just understanding what works on a content marketing standpoint on LinkedIn. And I'm a person that posts maybe two times per day. So this should give you a pretty adequate idea. So this is an image post, quote unquote. So to create an image post, uh, you essentially hop over to your profile. Uh, back to the home feed, uh, you click on photo, you upload whatever photo you have, etc. with some text. I think we can do it right now. Sure. So downloads, let's say we did this one, which is just the thumbnail of a previous YouTube video. And then you have the text post. So the text body on top as well. Usually the way I like to post uh, whenever I have an image post is I like to post a headline first. So in this case, uh, could say 10x your Reddit marketing. So just basic copywriting, right? The first line captures attention, so direct benefit using the IDA model. So attention, interest, desire, action uh, with a couple of variations as well. So 10x your Reddit marketing, uh, add an emoji as well so that it like captivates uh, attention, which we add here, 10x your Reddit marketing, add the dollar sign. Um, quick description of what the post is about. So in this case, because I'm promoting traffic off LinkedIn, right? Uh, it's basically an explainer of where I'm driving traffic to. So in this case, because it'd be a YouTube video about Reddit automation, uh, we would basically be driving traffic off LinkedIn onto the YouTube video. Now there's a catch here because if you include the link, let's say after we've included the body in the text, right? Um, the, the LinkedIn will essentially penalize you because it understands, and this is just, it's a hypothesis, but it's just something that I've been seeing happening post and po over on like many posts essentially. So if you include the link in the body of the text itself, so like, let's say right here, LinkedIn will penalize your post and you won't get as many views. But if you include the CTA, so the call to action in the comments, LinkedIn will still treat your post quote unquote organically, right? And it will give you the highest organic reach that you might have. And then your call to action is directly in the comments below. So in that case, it'd be body. And then um, you'd include video LinkedIn comments, essentially video LinkedIn comments, and then hashtags as well. Now, hashtags aren't a super major thing on LinkedIn, but they do help with your content. They help organize the content, quote unquote. So in this case would include Reddit, uh, other major hashtags would be marketing and then um, growth hacking. And then once you post that, uh, so we'll post it just to see. Once you post that, you'd essentially include your CTA in the comment section below. Otherwise, your post will be penalized. There's another workaround for this where you basically convert the link to a LinkedIn link because whenever you post something, LinkedIn will convert it to a LinkedIn link just to show you uh, how this works. So let's say if we took dot youtube.com, I think in this scenario, you should see a conversion. Uh, you don't. Uh, maybe they stopped doing it. Um, 
Regardless though, best practice is to include the link in the comment section just to not penalize the post. Then let's look at some other activities. So this was one of these type of posts with uh, our communities blowing up, 10K page views. This is about our growth hacking community that we started recently. Link in description plus growth uh, plus the hashtags. And then the link is right here, essentially. This post uh, over a time span of 19 hours had 163 views. And you'll slowly start to see a differentiation between the view count and the post type as well, which is the, the, the most important element of this section itself. Then here we have a poll essentially. This poll has been around for, well, you could say up to 48 hours, so two days. And it's a pretty generic poll, just asking people if they use LinkedIn over the weekend. The reason as to why I posted this was because I was on LinkedIn on the weekend and I was thinking like, do do people actually use LinkedIn over the weekend? Now, after COVID, et cetera, and after the, just the, the, the entire thing that we're going through right now, um, the, the pandemic, quote unquote, I personally feel that LinkedIn has become just more habitual for people, like uh, just as a habitual social media platform. It's pretty like uh, common for people to just, you know, open up their LinkedIn app and see what's up, right? Regardless of whether it's the weekend or the weekday. But I do feel that before the entire situation that we're facing right now, LinkedIn was more of a work week social media platform. So people opened it up from um, more of an aspect of necessity as opposed to anything and necessity from the aspect of, OK, it's Monday. I need to find leads for my business. Where do I go? I hop over to LinkedIn, maybe open up Facebook, find a couple of relevant Facebook groups and start outreaching in that manner. So post the situation that we have right now, it's become more of a habitual social media platform and the votes themselves actually reflect that. So what I was saying before, uh, if you click on this, so after you vote, the viewer actually has the ability to see who voted on the post and what selection they did. Now, a pretty smart way through which you can frame this essentially is create a post, uh, a poll that's industry related and that's related to your services, right? So like, um, for instance, are you interested in 10 x your deal flow in 2021? And then everybody that voted yes, do a manual or in some cases, again, gray area against the TNCs, but there's a lot of tools available. You can do an automated outreach. So one or the other, you choose a century. If you do a manual one, uh, your template would essentially be along the lines of, hey, I saw you voted on my poll that you'd be interested in 10x in your lead gen, uh, reaching out to see how we can potentially help you book a call, essentially. So for more information with regards to that, refer to the manual outreach section. All the chapters are in the description below. So that's one variable or one variety or just one uh, one possibility of an outreach that you can essentially do for the two uh, people that have voted positively on your poll. But the key metric, the, the most important metric in this case is that this got 10 times the views essentially. And of course, two times the time, like two X, but it uh, 1.6 K views. And then this post within 24 out 19 hours. So you could say 24 had 166. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty logical to just understand that this post, right, even though it's a text image and text post, it will never hit the potential of a poll itself. And this essentially just goes to show that polls are the most favored, um, variation of whatever you can post on LinkedIn at the moment. So pretty important to note 1.6 K views, whereas the text post had uh, the image post had 166. Then another poll here, 4.4 K views, four days, right? You can slowly start to see just the, 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 the variation in the numbers itself with 11 likes, three comments. So this is more of a niche down poll. So it's a blend of crypto and marketing, two things that I have an interest in. And uh, pretty simple questions. This poll didn't have a CTA. The do you use LinkedIn over the weekend? Again, just genuine interest towards whether people use LinkedIn over the weekend. Whereas on the flip side, uh, another poll right here, uh, which is a poll with a CTA. So the CTA in this case is an article that we spun up with content over at the growth hacking forum. So that's Growth Hackers Inc., etc. Highly recommend you join us, regardless of whether you're in B2C or B2B. The stuff that we post there is uh, like pretty high level growth hacks. So a lot of helpful resources there, plus you can network, etc. Um, and we're driving traffic directly to this post itself. So it's safe to assume that 
up to 5% of the people will look at the comment and potentially click it, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a flow happening from people viewing the post, voting, opening the comment after, and then heading over to the landing page that we've created or the article, etc. So the text body in this case, again, I skipped the headline in this case, because I feel like the poll offered a pretty decent headline, the, the biggest text, the, the most captivating one. Uh, should Google lift its crypto ad ban? And that's a, it's a news release that happened recently where Google partially lifted its crypto ad ban to essentially allow several crypto businesses that are in the US and registered with the FinCEN to basically advertise on Google's PPC platform. So I decided to basically spin up some content with regards to it, essentially asking people, should they lift its crypto ad ban, right? Uh, many people voted yes, some people voted no. 4.4K views, essentially. So these are some pretty big numbers, uh, like just to, to lay it down from the aspect of what other platforms have to offer. If you, for instance, if you start a fresh YouTube channel, for example, and um, you post your first video, uh, regardless of how well optimized it is, right? Because the channel is fresh, etc., you're likely to get, I don't know, maybe a hundred views within two weeks, for example. These are just like the realistic numbers of what you can expect from YouTube. If you hop over to your Facebook profile and you post a post, uh, a minuscule sub percentage, so less than 2% of your friends will essentially see your post. So again, if you have, I don't know, 800 friends, uh, maybe eight to 16 will essentially see it. The, these numbers are like up in the air, but just to give you an understanding of what other platforms have to offer with regards to organic reach, LinkedIn is pretty big essentially from that aspect. And especially when you pair it up with the aspect of B2B and high margin B2B, it can have some crazy potential. So in this case, uh, body hashtags, uh, mention of the CTA and the body itself. So just in case anybody read, I've included the whitelisting criteria in the comments below and then whitelisting requirements here. And then we've had a couple of comments, etc. people tagging, etc. engaging. So pretty good stuff nonetheless. So again, you're getting a, you're getting a pretty decent understanding of how to market your content on LinkedIn as we go and what post format to essentially have it in. Best variation at the moment, again, just hands down, is the poll with a text body um, and a combination that's well thought out. So you're thinking about it from the aspect of, okay, people will see the poll, they'll engage, then they'll likely read a little bit more because they have an interest with regards to what the poll is about, right? And then if they have more interest, they can essentially head off LinkedIn to the CTA. So in this case, it's this. Note, just super important, that I'm posting the CTA in the comments. If I posted the CTA in the body itself, my assumption is that this post would have, I don't know, maybe up to 50% less views because LinkedIn's algorithm understands that I'm driving people off platform and they'll essentially penalize me from an organic standpoint uh, just to essentially make up for that because every platform cares about maintaining its users on its platform. Uh, LinkedIn isn't in a partnership with Facebook nor in a partnership with uh, YouTube. They are in a partnership with uh, Bing and Microsoft and other Microsoft products. In that case, it makes sense. But they're key drive is to essentially maintain a user base and keep it engaged on the platform itself. If you can understand this, you'll go a long way. Um, so that's that. Then here we have another image ad. Again, just notice the numbers, 175 views, 4.4K views, four days, uh, four days. So it just gives you a pretty clean understanding with regards to what content format is most favored on the platform at the given moment. Again, potentially speaking, six to seven months down the line, it's gonna be different. It might be LinkedIn Live, it might be videos again. Heck, LinkedIn could even uh, create its own variation of like LinkedIn Shorts, you never know. But it's important to just note that there's always a variation that's most favored in most cases and to utilize that to the highest extent. Then here, another poll, uh, no code, low code is blowing up. So this is more of a, it's more of a niche down one because no code, low code, it's it's a term that not a lot of people will understand. Like if you're in a biz dev position in a bank and you see no code, low code, it's like, doesn't really make sense. But no code, low code is essentially uh, just tools that are popping up on the market that allow you to develop apps. So like applications, regardless of whether they're SaaS apps or, you know, uh, lifetime fee apps. Um, uh, and these applications give you the ability to develop these tools without like in half the time that's necessary as opposed to learning a development language, learning Java, learning SQL, uh, 
coding the full thing out, then coding a website, etc. No code, low code tools essentially minimize the time necessary, just the additional extra. So Paul, have you used any no code, low code tools? Then one comment, so it's my comment. CTA, again, just to not penalize the post. Uh, body of the text, hashtags, etc. 17 votes. Now, again, as I mentioned, with these 17 votes, we can click on them. And if I had the no code, low code solution, it'd be pretty easy for me to essentially just outreach to them. Like, hey, uh, I noticed that uh, you engaged on the content that I recently posted. Uh, you have used no code, low code tools in the past months. Uh, let's get a call up to see how our company could potentially. Um, 10x your app development, quote unquote. Again, just top of my head, but uh, just to give you guys a pretty clean understanding. Another poll, 3.7K views, another poll, another poll. Now, of course, on the flip side, uh, LinkedIn does also have additional formats. So you have articles, that's the first one. The cool thing about articles is you can publish them as a company, you can publish them as a personal profile, etc., or as any of the other companies that you're currently managing at the moment. Uh, usually what I do, anything that I do on LinkedIn before we even head into the articles, I do it on a personal profile level. And I'll showcase this right now just so that you guys have an understanding. Personal profile, you saw my stats. So 325 views, and that's the, the, like the, the lowest. The lowest actually was this one, 166. 1.6K views, 4.4K views, etc. Any posts that I ever did on my company page, and this is again, just stats from uh, consistent testing. Any posts that I ever did on my company page hit a max of, I don't know, 100 views maximum, regardless of what it was. So video post, right, on LinkedIn, I'm not guiding people off the platform, uh, only in the comment section, 68 views. Uh, a poll, in this case, 165 views. Then uh, an event, okay, then another post, 182 impressions. Why is this happening? That it's a pretty important question to essentially ask. LinkedIn has an ad platform and to understand the ad platform better, check the description below, time tags there, just hop over to the ad section where I break down all the different ad variations that you can post, how to set up the account, etc. cetera. Um, LinkedIn additionally also knows that companies are likely to spend a certain ad spend to, to, to increase themselves semi-organically or whatever, to essentially advertise whatever offer they have or advertise their content marketing. So it, just from a business standpoint, it doesn't make sense for LinkedIn to boost uh, organic content on company pages, right? Because this would essentially just kill the possibility of companies then running ads. Because if companies just post a company update and from a single company update, they get like 4K views, what's the point of heading over to the ad platform and running ads? So again, just a pretty important thing to understand. And this essentially justifies why LinkedIn doesn't post company pages so much, right? Why it primarily posts personal profiles as opposed to company pages. This is a result of the ad platform. Again, if the organic aspect of company pages was super high, people wouldn't advertise. So pretty important thing to understand. Once you like, once you get a, a pretty clear understanding of this, you'll also understand a lot of the reasons and the, 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 the meaning behind the actions that other social media platforms are taking, like Facebook, for example, right now, their organic reach has just diminished to like such a minuscule extent, uh, primarily because of the ad platform, because they know that if, they know that they're a pretty well-established platform, right? Facebook is like the first and the biggest at the given moment with like the highest count of users. Um, so they also know that they have an ad platform that nearly just about everybody can advertise on. Of course, excluding the account blockages that everybody's having and their super sensitive AI system that, I don't know, you, you launch an ad, it's approved, and then it's blocked two hours later for some unknown reason. And you get on the phone with a Facebook customer rep and you're like, why is the ad blocked? And they're like, we don't know because it's an AI system that's just super sensitive. So definitely something that they need to fix. But again, just to justify why, et cetera, it's, it, it's, um, it's a pretty important thing to understand. So as per the company pages. Now reverting back to the articles, the key thing, if I'm not mistaken, with regards to articles is that they are uh, SEO enabled. So these articles will also pop up on Google search results and we can actually test that right now. So 
they are SEO enabled as far as I know. Again, I might be mistaken. If you know that they're not, just comment in the comment section below. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but as far as I know, they are SEO enabled, so they will pop up on Google search results. So if somebody searches for anything that's related to the article itself, it'll come up on Google search results. And this basically has a two-way traffic system where you're getting traffic directly from LinkedIn. And then on the flip side, you're also getting traffic from Google search. Not to like the, the extent of like running a well SEO optimized uh, WordPress site, but still something. As per organic reach, um, articles don't really get so much traction. Uh, so if we look at some of the posts that we have on my profile, you'll actually be able to see a couple of the articles that I posted, if I posted any, which I'm sure I did. Uh, so activity, see all, and then you just filter by articles and you can see the post. So 35 views of your article, 2019 was the last time I tested it, 39 views, 16 views, 68 views, 46 views, 20 views. And this is just generally like my progression through business and uh, what I found interesting. And uh, it's like going way back, opening up the, the closet, quote unquote. But yeah, articles are, they're definitely a way, but it's not the preferred content format on LinkedIn because people it's it's pretty rare for people to make a time investment of where they see an article on linkedin and they're like okay let's read an article because the majority of the information right now is of course consumed through video that's one because videos can just condense all the information into a, a pretty short factor like a, a pretty short time span and just give you the exact same value right and you can listen to a video in the background so you could be uh, cooking, you could be, I don't know, you could be cleaning the house and at the same time listening to a video about the latest developments in marketing. The time investment necessary to read an article is significantly higher as opposed to listening to a video. So in that case, it just makes perfect sense uh, to essentially understand why uh, people wouldn't be so keen to essentially open up an article and read it, which of course also reflects on the stats in this case. But of course you can, you can definitely start writing articles, but it's not the preferred content format. I might be wrong. Other people might be having tremendous success with LinkedIn articles. If you know, they're, uh, they have good writing skills, etc. but it's, it's tricky. So if you're a novice or a beginner just starting out on LinkedIn, it isn't necessarily the, uh, the, the best way to go forward, quote unquote. But uh, back to the different uh, post formats. So photo, that's the other one. Then video, where you essentially post a video. An example of this would be the video on the company page itself. So again, pretty simple. You just you edit it, you upload it, make sure that the resolutions are 1920, 1080p. And and then the the last but not least is the, the plain text post. So essentially where you just start a post, plain text post. So uh, whatever, I, I think I have an example of plain text post. I'm not sure. Maybe we can find one on the home feed itself. So text post in this case is this one. So simple text post essentially. So you just scroll up, uh, you include the body of the text, a couple of hashtags, and then you get likes and comments. As to how they perform, I'm not too sure because I can't see the stats, but I do know as a fact that polls right now, if you're just getting started, if you want to get profile views, profile visits, they're the best way to essentially grow your profile. And we can look at some stats here as well. Uh, so on your dashboard, and this is something that I've covered in the profile optimization level, the key thing, of course, is the all-star uh, label right here, which essentially means that you've set up your profile to the, the, the best requirements and the best standard of LinkedIn at the present moment. So you've added just about all the information that you can add. But on the flip side, what the dashboard offers additionally is information with regards to uh, how many people have viewed your profile. So this stat is pretty important because it showcases how many views you're getting on your profile. This spike right here is a direct result of a certain LinkedIn poll that I did where people saw the poll, then they checked my profile. So it's important to essentially keep an eye on this metric because it shows you how well your profile is performing, essentially how many people are being driven to your profile. And this number is directly correlated to how many people are clicking on your featured posts. So let's head over to my profile. So featured posts would be these, how many people are engaging with your CTA, clicking on your website, etc. 
pretty important metric, keep an eye on it. And here you can also see the views that you have on your profile. So who's viewing your profile, etc. So you can engage with them as well. You can even um, essentially engage in an outreach campaign where you're basically texting people saying, hey, I see you viewed my profile. Is there anything I can assist you with? Just from a, a networking standpoint, pretty important to note. The post views as well. So this segment essentially tells you how many people have viewed your post, your latest one. So despite the fact that a post had 4.4K views, the latest post only got 165. Again, because we're testing different formats of content on LinkedIn always just to see which one is performing best. And then search appearances as well. I covered that in the profile optimization section. Check the time uh, marks below. But essentially, yeah, as per content marketing, that's that. The key elements to take away is that LinkedIn will always have a preferred content format most of the time. And uh, don't fall into the trap of trying to begin a content marketing campaign with a company page uh, as opposed to a, a personal profile because personal profiles will always outperform a company page from an organic perspective. And the reason to that is essentially the ad platform. So if there was no ad platform, in that case, it makes sense. But um, at the moment, that's that. So LinkedIn did uh, two features as well to basically keep an eye on. LinkedIn did roll out a uh, content creator mode. So this one right here where you basically have the featured section and the the talks about section as well but uh the the key thing to note is that i haven't really seen any additional benefits other than that by the time you're watching this video linkedin might take this feature out of quote unquote beta and just expand on it further but for the given moment um it, it's nothing too cool it's just after you post a couple of posts linkedin will essentially give you the ability and after your connection level has risen to a uh, like 500 plus linkedin will say like are you a creator and then you can basically opt in or opt out and um the secondary thing so the 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 final thing is essentially the newsletter so a couple of posts right now and a couple of articles that i'm seeing are newsletter enabled now i don't have the feature yet unfortunately uh, so next but a couple of people are basically able to publish newsletters across linkedin that's something that i haven't discovered yet i know that the, the feature is, is around and i think it's being rolled out in like a, a closed beta quote unquote because not everybody has a feature or i just don't know how to activate it uh, but i will release a video in the future if there's enough demand on uh, linkedin newsletters but um, as per the content marketing segment i think that, that that's those are the key points if you're looking to start out if you have a profile that's not getting enough views etc just understanding how the algorithm works what the incentives of the platform are and how they incentivize content creators to basically use those incentives so as to get more views and more traction so that's about that What is up guys? So in this session, in this segment of the full course guide, I don't even know what to call it anymore because it's like probably the longest video that I've ever done. Um, in this segment, we're basically gonna go over the LinkedIn ad system. So to access the ad system, you just log into your profile, preferably through a PC. Uh, you click on work and then here you can see any additional linkedin products that linkedin has so if you click on advertise this will essentially take you to the dashboard of your ad platform your ad platform might not look the same like mine it will look the same from a basic standpoint but it won't have the uh, extra additions that i have with regards to accounts campaigns etc in this segment of the accounts uh, you can basically allocate the accounts that you have and the accounts that you advertise from so here you can see that i've done quite a few tests i've run a couple of campaigns i haven't been advertising a lot uh since uh, since july but uh, i'm still like running a couple of micro tests here and there and then if you click on account name after you create an account of course you'll essentially be driven to the campaigns of your account itself so just a couple of key points with regards to the uh, LinkedIn advertising platform uh, before we hop on over to the intrinsics of setting up a campaign and the different ad types, etc. LinkedIn isn't the cheapest ad platform out there. If you compare uh, the cost per click on LinkedIn to, let's say, Google or Facebook or Bing or Quora, and I'm also stating alternative ad platforms because I have a particular interest towards them because they, they are low cost. They're tricky, but they could be highly effective if played out right. If you compare the uh, general cost per click of $13 on LinkedIn from just the standard banner ads where you see an ad on the feed or uh, 
a text ad on the side of the feed, etc. of $13 to, let's say, a highly competitive PPC campaign. Okay, in that case, it makes sense. But if you compare it to, let's say, a Facebook ad where you can basically get a click for $1 or even less if the campaign is well optimized, you start to understand that LinkedIn is a little expensive from the, from the aspect of just metrics, essentially. The reason behind this is because you, you, you're not, you, you wouldn't like sell a low margin e-commerce product on LinkedIn. You wouldn't start drop shipping ads on LinkedIn where your margin is like 20 bucks, for instance. Those campaigns require a certain platform and the best platform for that, like for drop shipping ads is Facebook, Pinterest right now as well. I actually released a video on a uh, Pinterest drop shipping test that I did with a digital product. So not exactly a drop shipping test, but if you're interested, check it out. Uh, but LinkedIn isn't exactly that platform. It's more expensive. It's more competitive just from a, a, a bidding uh, angle as well. And the products and services that are best suited are essentially high margin, B2B and in some, case, uh, in some cases, B2C products as well. Successful ad campaigns that I'm aware of that have been run on LinkedIn uh, are ad campaigns by just big car manufacturers like Mercedes targeting C-level executives with their C-Class, for instance. I think it was either Mercedes or Audi. But the example gives you the direction with regards to what type of ads you should run and what you should advertise. Additionally, um, Ads that would potentially run well are service-based ads. So if you're a marketing agency and you're offering services to individuals within the finance sector, you can run ads. Um, but essentially, yeah, you get the gist. The, the, the whole point is just be mindful with regards to what you're advertising on LinkedIn. Make sure that the process is well thought out because $15 per click, if you have a daily ad budget of like 200 bucks, it can disappear pretty quickly if you don't know what you're doing. So it's important to essentially keep that in mind. But on the flip side, uh, the good thing is that LinkedIn offers several uh, ad types. So if you click on create campaign group, we'll just call this the YouTube test and status active, start date, we'll set it up from tomorrow. So start date basically uh, indicates to LinkedIn when you want the campaign to start. Uh, you can set a start date and an end date. Usually if it's open-ended and you're testing a certain campaign, you want the budget to be the limit and not the duration, essentially. So you want to limit it on the budget level and not the time level. So in this case, we'll just say uh, start date 8 of 11, save. Uh, and that's the campaign group started. So YouTube. Then to create the campaign and the ad and to just show you the different variations of ads that exist. In this scenario, you basically click next. It's just telling you that you're going to run them in this campaign group, which is more of an organizational feature. Uh, and then here you select the objective. Now, this isn't just across LinkedIn, it's across all ad platforms. Uh, uh, most social media platforms that have ads enabled essentially usually uh, are able to optimize your ads for against the data that they have against their audience, essentially. So if they know that you have a, let's say LinkedIn profile that clicks a lot, right? They'll place you under the website visit optimization objective. So if you're a CEO in the finance industry, right? And I'm running an ad that targets this demographic and I choose website visits, there's a high chance that this ad will be shown to you. So it's just LinkedIn essentially helping you with the optimization so as to optimize your ad budget for the objective that you're looking for. It's a helping hand, quote unquote, with their algorithm. If it's uh, conversions, for instance, so uh, leads, etc. cetera, they, they don't really include purchases because not a lot of people sell B2C products on LinkedIn, but if it's website conversion, so like a lead gen form on a website, for instance. So if we hop over to Inside Insight, and then we set up a conversion here of book a call, and we count this as a conversion essentially, or we count it on the calendar level, which of course you can do, uh, it's gonna optimize for that. So people that essentially convert lead generation, uh, it's going to optimize for people that fill out a LinkedIn lead gen form, which I'll showcase uh, in a few. Then video views, it's going to optimize for people that like to watch videos on uh, LinkedIn. Engagement, people that engage, so comment, etc., who follow. And then brand awareness is just more open-ended. So it's the minimized optimization. This is a hypothesis, I'm not 100% sure, but it makes sense that this feature would essentially be just LinkedIn showing your ad to everybody because it's brand awareness. You don't really care about any direct conversions coming from the ad and you just want 
to appear in front of people over and over again and then potentially retarget them with a matched audience because that's what custom audiences are being called on LinkedIn uh, for, um, for conversions because marketers essentially know that if I market to you uh, on the first day that I meet you or within the first hour that I meet you and I immediately ask for a conversion, so hey, fill out your form, uh, fill out this form, give me your, your details, it's a pretty hard ask. But if you saw me yesterday and then I approach you as well the second day and I'm like, hey, by the way, I saw that you saw us yesterday. Uh, if you're interested, fill out this lead form to get more information. There's a time space, a time span between the initial engagement and the secondary engagement. So the ask itself. This time span is responsible for just developing trust because trust requires time above all. It's hard to trust somebody that you meet in the first hour unless you, you just spend some time with them, etc., or just spend some time alone thinking about the encounter, etc. It's sort of the same in marketing. So if you're able to space out the initial exposure and then the ask itself by using a brand awareness campaign and then also using a matched audience campaign, basically retargeting everybody that already saw your ad a couple of hours or a couple of days ago, the chance of conversion is essentially higher. It's basic marketing 101. But these are the different objectives. Again, objectives are just basically LinkedIn optimizing the ad for you. So in this case, uh, we'll essentially choose uh, We'll choose website visits, quote unquote, because the ad that I was doing before, and this is an ad that I'd like to replicate right now, was an ad driving traffic onto a community that I'd formed. So it's more of a brand awareness campaign as opposed to an immediate ask, right? And it's basically driving people from uh, the messaging system, from the LinkedIn email system, directly to a growth hacking WhatsApp community that we started that's essentially, of course, full of different growth hackers from a wide array of industries, but on the flip side as well, filled with other B2B executives and C-levels. So agency owners, service providers, uh, SaaS owners, etc. So first things first, uh, you can, of course, create a new audience or you can use the save audience. So a saved audience, uh, this is exactly where your audience from the matched uh audience would come up. So the matched audience is basically the custom audience of LinkedIn. This is where it would come up. Uh, LinkedIn audiences as well. This is exemplified audiences that LinkedIn creates for you. Uh, but to create a cost, uh, like a new audience is pretty easy. So here you choose the location itself. So in this case, we'll do uh, United States. Also note that the the cost of the metrics, so the CPM and the CTR will vary depending upon the location that you're targeting. So if you're running an ad in, uh, New Delhi, for instance, or in India, uh, the CPM and the CTR will be drastically cheaper as opposed to advertising in the United States or Australia. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think Australia is even more expensive than the US. And we can show that right here. So United States and the ad format, we can choose it right here. Ad format, before we proceed, super important because this is how your ad will be represented. So single image ad basically is, we can find one right here. It's this is a, an ad. If you're on your home feed and you ever see promoted, it's an ad basically. So this is a single image ad with a CTA driving you to veen.info basically, which is etc. It's German. I'm getting these ads because my location on LinkedIn is based as Austria essentially. So those are the single image ads. Carousel image ads are basically exactly like this, but there's three images. So you can basically click through them and it drives engagement. Then uh, on the flip side, you also have video ads. So exactly like this, but with a video here as opposed to the image. Uh, so if you want a video ad, take some time to actually think about it. Subtitle the ad as well, because the ad will essentially have an autoplay, but in mute. If it's subtitled with just a good font and a well-sized font, you're able to capture attention without necessarily having people click uh, click on the audio icon of the ad itself. I think we can find the video ad if I'm not mistaken. Not a lot of people post them to be honest. Okay. Um, so here's a video. It's not an ad, not to, uh, he, this guy kicks ass with regards to LinkedIn content marketing and he's part of the bootcamp and part of our community as well. But as you can see, most of the videos just play without any audio. If we enable audio, He got an intro as well. So if you enable audio, you can basically hear it. Otherwise, it just plays in the background. So make sure to include subs, not to include subs. <laughs> um, 
so pretty important. Then text that uh, show up right on the column on the top of the LinkedIn page. So text ads, essentially, this isn't a text ad, this is another format, but a text ad is essentially this. So new technology research, discover. This is a example of a basic text ad. So two lines, headline one, headline two, sort of like a PPC or a Bing ad, quote unquote, with just the, a headline. And then if you click on it, it drives you to the this is actually a linkedin ad essentially so linkedin uses their own ad platform but yeah just to lay down the features spotlight ad that's the ad that i showed previously so this one this is a spotlight ad where it takes your profile and the a logo or any other image that you basically set up and it compares the two just uh it's like quote unquote forced engagement but it it, it gives you a perspective i remember once i had like my profile photo and mcdonald's and it's like mcdonald's is Kirill, there's opportunities for you at McDonald's. I found it quite funny. Of course, I have nothing against people working at McDonald's, uh, but it's, it, I don't know. I've, yeah, I don't know. I'll probably cut this part out, but uh, it's, it, it, if done correctly, it can have a great effect. If done in a wrong way, it can also have a bit of a negative effect, quote unquote. Nothing against McDonald's, just uh, part of my uh, stupidity, quote unquote. But yeah, spotlight ad, that's the other thing. Then, my favorite ads essentially are message ads and conversation ads. And to be entirely honest, my favorite favorite ad is primarily the message ad as opposed to the conversation ad because the conversation ad overcomplicates the ad flow, which I'll explain shortly. Uh, the two main ad segments that we're gonna be focusing on here is the message ad and the conversation ad because uh, in most cases, as far as I know, most of the people that will watch this video are essentially service providers that are running an agency with one to 10 people, right? And you aren't necessarily bowling like uh, Mercedes or Chevrolet is selling cars to C-level executives. If you are, uh, this is definitely an option, but it's costly. So make sure that you have a product that has the margins that can be eaten up, right? In the scenario of where you're running the ad and you're also not just breaking even, but making money as well. Because again, if you're running a, just to run crunch some numbers for you if you're running a uh, if you're running a lead generation service for 2.5k quote unquote uh, per month right and you're generating x number of leads and it's a it's a steady system so you do some linkedin you do some cold email and it's a set price of 2.5k if you are spending let's say 500 dollars to acquire uh one customer will leave out the calls just to simplify the flow if you're spending that amount of money you're essentially left with 2k right uh, as the margin itself and then of course you have employee costs service delivery costs etc so you need to calculate the numbers just to make sure that even if we spend x amount we're still making x amount in return right that's profit for the company so not just revenue important to essentially it's basic it's like basic business but it's super important to basically consider whenever you're running an ad considering an ad platform etc two major ones that we're going to be focusing on are message and conversion ads and uh, you can basically see that depending upon your budget right x number of messages are going to be sent the main reason as to why i'm basically selecting this uh why I'm selecting this ad type as an example and why I have an interest in this ad type personally speaking is because LinkedIn is sort of doubling down on limiting the amount of organic exposure that you can get by connecting with people and sending connection requests and messages by limiting some profiles to 100 connections per week, right? So the best second way, uh, despite the fact that it's a little bit more expensive than organic and in some cases automated, again, against TNCs, so against LinkedIn's terms and conditions, keep that in mind. If you do take the risk, your profile might get banned. LinkedIn is amping up its countermeasures against automation as well. So just bear that in mind. I'll cover more on that uh, in the add-on section check the description, all the timestamps are there for the entire guide course. I don't know what to call it. Tell me what to call it in the comment section below. But all of that in the description. So main reason as to why I'm taking a particular interest is because the ad platform is essentially doubling down on the aspect of just locking in how many messages you can send, how many people you can connect with. So the second best way is to essentially use promoted in mails, right? Uh, select the target market and then just outreach to them in the exact same way that you'd outreach to them via cold email outreach. So if cold email outreach is something that you have experience with before, or if it's something that you've run for your company, your campaign, regardless of whether it's manual or automated, whether you're using tools like uh, Lemlist or Snov or whatever, it's definitely a possibility slash opportunity for you as well. So 
just to break it down one thing that i also want to show is the following so let's say we set up our daily budget to ten dollars for instance just to test the campaign before anything happens the bidding strategy and this remains the same for all ad types is basically how much you're willing to pay per result as i said the geolocations and the job titles will essentially affect the cost of the ad itself so if we're targeting united states audience attributes so just like linkedin's basic search job experience job titles uh ceo and then it should pop up right here within the industry of uh so narrow audience further audience attributes uh within the industry of should be right about here uh interest in trades demographics industry company company industries within the industry of say financial services so finance no finance job titles finance and then just select all of these as well you'll see that the bid right remains the same we can bring it down to 30 cents per message 30 cents per cent but at the same time if we change the location to let's say you uh, australia i think it should be more expensive by a couple of cents so australia 55 you can see that the price already went up from 30 cents to 55 cents and this is in euros essentially this cost, so this manual bidding cost, and I always do a manual bid whenever I run LinkedIn campaigns, is essentially how much you're willing to spend per uh, a certain metric. So in this case, because it's an in-mail campaign, and in-mails will in-mail campaigns will essentially show up in your um, segment right here. So in the inbox, right, it will show up here as an in-mail. So an example of an in-mail campaign that I did was this. So sponsored. Uh, quick question. So. Kiro, uh, you get the sponsored so it tells you that it's an ad right subject so this is exactly why i'm saying if you have experience with cold email it's going to pay off with regards to in-mail ads uh sponsored quick question uh first name so you can add variables which i'll showcase later and then cta book a free call driving traffic to the calendly if you notice this is the exact same calendly that is here on inside insights page as well by the way guys if you haven't joined the growth hacking community so growth.insightinsight.at make sure to join it because uh, a lot of free value is being posted there then uh back to the uh back to the basics essentially so the bidding will essentially just change depending upon the location that you choose in this example again we'll choose united states because the at the uh, the segment of the demographic is essentially bigger so us uh target audience 140k make sure that it's a minimum of a hundred thousand otherwise your ad won't deliver so make sure that because sometimes you can get into advanced targeting where you're targeting people from groups for example because you know that if somebody has joined a b2b lead generation group they're either somebody who's seeking b2b lead generation services or they're a b2b lead generation service provider uh depending upon that targeting your target audience size will essentially decrease right make sure that it's at a minimum of a hundred thousand otherwise linkedin will approve the ad but your ad will just uh, not perform from the aspect of it won't deliver you won't nothing's gonna happen so in this case we'll choose us and we'll choose again job titles company industries vcs finance etc this segment right here is pretty uh, important because it tells you that within a day right uh by spending two euros you're gonna get six message cents and then by spending 11 you're gonna get 37. so it just tells you what to expect quote unquote so if we increase the bid it increases by a little bit but if we keep it at uh 0 0.3 and then we expand the audience further we should essentially have more sense very important metric to keep an eye on because it's going to tell you whether your ad is going to perform or not so let's also do founder and co-founder and then director managing director set 580 and then let's also increase the daily budget to 30 and then okay set so already we know that like by spending 33 euros per day you're going to get 110 message cents um so pretty important thing to keep an eye on i'm just trying to see if we can increase it further potentially 110 by 33 and then you can essentially 
double down on that. Let's see if we can increase it a little bit further. So seven, 230 euros, 700. And that's pretty okay. So over a seven day period, it's telling you that the lowest that it should get is by spending 39, 130 message cents and by spending 230, 780 message cents. So this basically showcases what type of results you can expect within a day with regards to message cents. Of course, you also have the variable of message opens, which is pretty important. And I'll explain the subject that best performs with regards to maximizing your open rate as well. And then over a seven day period, you know that by spending 230 euros or bucks uh, euros in this case, you're gonna get 780 message cents and then 30, right? 3.3k by spending a thousand if you divide it by uh, half so as to basically account for a 50 percent open rate you should essentially over a seven day period have approximately 340 to 400 people seeing your ad and then depending upon how well your message performs as well a minuscule amount will essentially convert to a click how many of those convert to a call to a community to a person joining the community etc it all depends upon your total ad flow right which i can't showcase right now in this video it's more of a it's a more complex topic like uh, what's the word for it conversion rate optimization cro essentially that's the taking into account the entire flow itself so if you want to maximize that that's the best way to essentially look to minimize any complications any difficulties etc with regards to opting in joining a community entirely different topic but important to take into account so once you select the ad format again in this case we'll go with message ads and then after i'll essentially explain conversation ads as well you can also, so you cannot expand the audience network through placements for in-mail ads. Select the daily budget, make sure that it's uh, within your, your actual budget. And then here you have the option of basically running the campaign continuously until you stop it or running the campaign continuously until it meets the lifetime budget itself or setting both a daily and lifetime budget, which I personally don't use. Um, or setting a daily budget and then setting a start and end date. So let's say spend 30 bucks per day, quote unquote, with a bid of 30 cents per message. So 30 bucks per day with an end date of, let's say the 14th. So then you know that you're gonna spend 1.8K, quote unquote, uh, cause it's a month ahead, right? And it's gonna run for 36 days. So that's, uh, th th that's essentially an option. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose August 12th, etc., 90 bucks. And then just for example's sake, we're gonna minimize this to 10 set. And then manual bidding, most important part, just play around with this, see which performs better. Usually I just choose the lowest end, especially when it comes to in-mail ads, cause uh, you are competing with other in-mailers, right? But I personally found that it still performs even if you choose the lowest ad set itself. And then conversion tracking, this is a different topic. I'll make a video on it later on how to set up uh, conversion tracking for LinkedIn. Pretty easy process, but it essentially just tracks the conversion for your metrics and optimizes for conversions with the ad as well. So it's the segment that I mentioned earlier with regards to LinkedIn optimizing its audiences to fulfill and deliver on your ad in the best way possible. So then you click on next, essentially. Cannot be changed, save. Gives you a small warning, save, campaign saves. And now we head over to the topic of the creative itself. So. In mail and conversation ads, the flow is exactly the same. There's one differentiation with regards to the delivery of the ad, which I'll showcase right now. So in mail ads, uh, you essentially choose the sender, you set a name for the campaign. So let's say we'll do a quick question, uh, variation 0.01 and then 10 slash 08 set. And then you add yourself as a sender and then the message exactly like email people will initially see the subject of the message itself. So quick cue, essentially quick question. If you have it as too promotional, if you have it as uh, too spammy, people won't click the in-mail message because nobody's gonna click on the in-mail message and be like, okay, I wanna get sold, you know? I, I, I wanna see what's on the market right now. Whereas if you keep it um, personalized and quote unquote mysterious to a certain extent, the chance of them clicking your ad and actually reading the message is significantly higher. So there's two variations that you can do. Of course, test them just to see which works for you and which doesn't. If you include a, let's say 10 X your deal flow, it's salesy. It might not get enough opens, but it's indicative of what the ad is. So the, the, the level of intention with regards to the people that open your ad will significantly be higher. Whereas with quick question, the, 
uh, them opening the ad is higher, but the chance of them intentionally opening the ad in an effort to basically find out about how they can 10x their deal flow is lower. So it's it's a scale to keep in mind. It's uh, just from a, a meta standpoint of just knowing what's happening. It, it, be thoughtful about it, be mindful, consider it, think about it, and just come to a marketing mix of where you've taken everything into account and you've also split tested a couple of different variations to see which works better. So in most cases, when you do run ads, you won't just be running one. You'll be running a couple of different variations, hence why I always add variation 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.3 per ad campaign so that you can basically see which variation is sticking better. So the way this works, and I explain this in the Growth Hacking Bootcamp as well, is in this scenario, we're only setting up one, but in your scenario, if you're seriously looking to launch an email sponsored email campaign, the best way to do it is to launch five variations with the minimum ad spend over a five day period. Towards the end of that ad spend and towards the end of that five day period, you basically want to see which of the variations has been performing better because logically speaking, just from a marketing perspective, if you run a 30 day campaign of an un unoptimized ad, and you compare it to the performance of a 25 day campaign of an optimized ad, the, the difference is pretty big at the end of the day. So if you take into account, let's say a five day delay for optimization, just to increase the potency of the 25 days that you're going to be running the ads for, that difference is going to be pretty big, especially over a like elongated time span at the end of the day. So just take that into account, run as many variations as possible. In this case, we'll run with 01. So subject, in my case, personally, I like to use quick question. You'll even see me use this over and over again in anything I do with uh, cold email or even warm email to my own database. Usually it's just quick question. I'll formulate whatever I have to offer in a quick question like, hey, um, are you interested in learning more about growth hacking? Click here, et cetera, and done. So it still is a quick question, right? The offer is pretty simple and they can take action by just clicking a, a link essentially. And then start typing your message. Be aware of the variables. So include a couple of variables. Um, don't overdo it. Oopsie. Don't overdo it. Um, but in this case, let's say we're running the previous ad that I did. So uh, first name, ta ta ta. Or no, we'll do the we'll do the join us, which is a value first approach of the community itself. Uh, let's head back to the ad itself. So it should be this one, first name. First name basically pulls the first name of the profile itself. Uh, last name pulls the last name, company name pulls the company name, job title, etc. They work to an extent, but I'm not too keen on like including a lot of variables in an in-mail ad because people still know that it's an ad because it's sponsored. So they immediately know as soon as they see sponsored that in most cases, ah, this person launched it through the ad campaign. It's it's a mass message, right? You can't fake uh, an ad being personalized, quote unquote. You can increase targeting to a pretty high point, right? You can retarget people that have engaged with your brand before to increase effectiveness, but you can't uh, fake total personalization through an ad primarily because of the sponsored segment right here. So back to that, I keep losing the page. First name, uh, Kirill here from Inside Insight. Keep it short. So it, definitely keep it short because I'll just show you two variations right now. Uh, again, I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, diss his ad or anything of that sort. This is in German, but and like my my uh, skill of reading German is like zero. I I can't read German, just the basics, but just from the the length of the message right it's the only reason as to why i'm saying this is because i've run successful cold email campaigns and we still run them etc if you want to learn more about them growth hacking bootcamp or book a call with the agency itself but the number one rule right now with regards to copywriting and email templates and everything is short is key because the everything is just looked at from a time investment level. What I mean by this is the following. If you receive a, uh, if you receive an email uh, basically from somebody with just a huge paragraph talking about their services and what they're able to do, sure, they are providing more information with regards to their services and their capabilities, but on the flip side, the time investment that you need to put as a consumer in order to digest all of that information 
it's significantly higher as opposed to somebody that's gonna send you a four line email that's pretty brief, but explains the key points and what they're able to do. The short email will always outperform the long form copy in this case. Long form copy, of course, has its own place, but usually the way that long form copy works best is when you're actually on LinkedIn. So like, let's say I'm actually on LinkedIn and I'm running, I come across an actual ad that looks like content and I've already made the investment to basically engage with the content. So I'm like, okay, let's read it. Long form copy, da, 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 and then CTA, right? If it's an ad, if it's salesy as well, if it's an email, because it's not content, I'm, I'm not in a, I'm not in my reading mode, quote unquote, right? The, the chance of me engaging and reading is lower as opposed to a short form text that tells exactly what you're able to do or what the company can do for me and then a brief CTA right under. That's, it's, it, so in mail, it's only recently that like marketers are like moving into it and just utilizing it to the highest extent. In most cases, most of the marketers right now are utilizing in mail to the highest extent, primarily because automation is essentially dying. So they need the alternative. And in some cases, even though in mails are a little bit more expensive from a sponsored in mail standpoint, they are effective nonetheless. So keep it short and keep it sweet. Oh, keep it short and keep it sweet. Uh, so in this case, yeah, short max, like one, two, three, four, five lines maximum. Um, and then CTA. So the CTA is basically added here. So in this case, the body is first name, Kirill here from Inside Insight. You should definitely join our growth hacking WhatsApp community where marketers and growth hackers from numerous industries come together to network and share knowledge regarding their latest findings in both B2B and B2C marketing. Feel free to add me as a connection and PM me if you have any questions whatsoever. This is an ad that I've run and I had results from it. Not the best, not the most optimized, but we did have uh, people joining the group from, uh, this was targeting uh, just EU countries, EU essentially with the job title of uh, anything to do with marketing, quote unquote. So keep it short, keep it sweet. Uh, you can add a customer footer for terms and conditions. Usually I don't because you want to keep it as non addy as possible. And when I say addy, just like, you don't want it to look like a full on ad. You want it to be semi-personalized, get the person thinking, etc. And then the call to action. Uh, so in this case, join, right? And then the landing page in this case, which is the WhatsApp group that we had before. Cool thing about LinkedIn is unlike Facebook and other ad platforms, they're not too picky on um, where you can drive traffic to. And you'll see this with Bing as well, right? So Google is like amping up its uh, quote unquote security protocol about where you can send traffic to. Bing is more loose. You'll see this across Microsoft products in general. They're l more laxed with regards to where you can drive traffic to. So even though I, even, I didn't even think this link would get approved, but it did. And I drove traffic to it and it worked. And then the banner creative. So this segment right here, where you can basically upload an image with dimensions of 300 to 250. And I'll show you an example right here. Uh, and this basically shows up Let's see, this shows up right here. So it's an image and if you click it, it's a CTA. It works the same like a button. Because it's on the side, I don't know how I feel about it. I personally didn't include it in my other ads, but you can test and include it. And from a marketing perspective, it makes sense that it would perform better because you're taking up more space, quote unquote, on the like on the on the on the screen, right? You have this and then you have this and it can showcase additional features. I haven't mastered it yet, uh, test it out. Let me know how it goes in the comment section below, but it's a possibility. You can build these type of banner ads through Canva with like millions of pre-built templates. Just make sure that your fonting is correct. So $50 in free ad credits, uh, the sizing of the text is most important with regards to banner ads. So 50 bucks in free ad credits. I would generally size it a little bit differently, but that's just me. Um, so that's with regards to that. And then essentially you create and then it's in draft mode right now. So I can make it active. As soon as you make it active, the ad will start, will go into review. And then once it goes into review, you can basically, it will essentially start delivering if it's approved. In most cases, your ads are approved unless you've just done some, I don't know, like quote unquote noob mistake where you've misspelled something or anything, they'll essentially help you out in that aspect just to make sure that you don't make a fool of yourself um, by messaging thousands of people the spelling mistake, but usually they get approved. Most important thing, if you're launching a in-mail or a conversational ad is send a test message just to see how it looks. So we'll close this, 
head back up and then you can see that I've essentially sent myself a test message saying, of course, it's Kirill Kirill here, etc. join. And if you click it, it takes you to the CTA, which in this case is Growth Hackers Inc. To excuse the Greek, I'm in a Greek speaking country at the moment. But yeah, so that's essentially it with regards to setting the ad and running the campaign. Now on the flip side, if it was a conversational ad, this is essentially where it gets a little bit more tricky, but still pretty simple. Conversational ads, I'll show you the, I'll show you an example right here. Request credits, claim your free ad credit. This is a conversational ad, essentially. So conversational ads are these right here, conversation. And the they're cool, but because I, I personally don't know how I feel about them. Like they are cool, right? But they give the uh, they give the prospect more CTAs, more call to actions, and running an ad with more call to actions, right, complicates the process. So the chance of me engaging in this, so reading it and then learn more, etc., it, it it complicates the process for me. So the the chance of me just not engaging and not uh, placing the time investment necessary to engage with the ad is significantly higher, so of me not engaging, uh, as opposed to just a single CTA, but this is exactly what they are. So you can click around, and this is gonna drive you to one CTA, this is gonna drive you to schedule a call, and then connections and careers. So it essentially drags you to different uh, elements of the website itself. So learn more, takes you to the program page, schedule a call, alternatively takes you to this, if I were to run an ad, I wouldn't run a conversation ad. I would just run a CTA, right? And then I would also run a, another split test ad where I basically target people with a learn more, essentially, in that case. Learn more, schedule a call, and then, yeah, okay. <laughs> and um, essentially, yeah, I mean, briefly put, like, that's about it. And then once the ad is running, you will essentially see the metrics. So YouTube, we haven't started, but just to showcase one ad that I was testing recently uh, with regards to driving traffic onto the website. This is the exact same ad that I was setting up right now, but I set it up before basically. And key thing is open rate. So keep it simple. The uh, subject here was join us and it had a 80% open rate. If your subject sucks, people won't open it. If they don't open it, right, the chance of them essentially clicking uh, through to the CTA is significantly lower. So keep that in mind, treat it exactly like an email. And then here you have your key results. So how many website visits? So seven for 15 bucks. So CT, uh, CPC is two euros, can be decreased further, uh, but it's qualified traffic essentially. And then here you see the sends, how many sends you got, how many opens, message ad clicks, how many people click the CTA on the ad itself. So the CTA in this case would essentially be the join, how many people clicked from the message sent, um, and too many tabs. And uh, essentially, yeah, pretty simple. And then here you have additional stats, cost per open, which is pretty important because then you need to uh, you need to assess the ad from a cost per open standpoint because it's only once they open it, they're exposed to the ad itself. So in this case, it's 13 cents. This is a little bit lower as opposed to, it could be and it could not be, but generally speaking. I'm just trying to uh, assess as to whether it's cheaper to run in-mail ads as opposed to banner ads. Personally speaking, from just the preliminary testing that I'm doing, I feel that it's a little bit lower, quote unquote. I could be wrong, but it's just my preferred way of advertising. If you want to test out other ad methods, uh, they're right here. Just make sure you have the budget to do it. But essentially speaking, that's that. My main ones are message ads and conversation ads. And then you have event ads, which are essentially the exact same thing as the above, right? So single image carousel. But uh, what you're doing is you're basically advertising an event. So in this case, if you wanna see the event section, it's in the description below. Check the uh, timestamps. I made a full segment about LinkedIn events just because of how, uh, how they're easy to market organically and the type of results that you can expect and the best practices as well. One of the ways to which you can, of course, uh, market an event, other than the quote unquote growth hack that I showed where you're inviting a thousand connections at once to an event uh, per week and you can increase this number, I think by inviting more speakers, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments section, is of course through a in-mail ad. 
so too many tabs in this case event add etc so an event add driving traffic directly to it and then of course if they opt in if they rsvp that's a whole different story but this is the ad platform quote unquote uh i will release an additional video in the future on conversion tracking if it's of course requested but the the basics of it are the following what is up guys so um the final segment this one the finale quote unquote of our course slash guide not sure what i'm going to call it uh is essentially linkedin live and add-ons so as per linkedin live uh if you watch the previous segment that i made with regards to linkedin events uh my hypothesis is hypothesis is that um uh, by pairing up linkedin events with a linkedin live you're essentially decreasing the complexity of moving from the event to the actual session itself so your engagement rate and the attendance rate should essentially be higher the best uh the 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 best way to get linkedin live because it's a beta feature that's uh being rolled out slowly as opposed to everybody having access to it is through this page which i will essentially link in the description below essentially through this page and then once you have it uh once you have this page opened up the only thing that you basically need to do is include your email of course so in this case just your alternate email upon which you can be contacted on and state whether you're looking to perform live broadcasts through a member page or a linkedin page so in this case because i'll be doing them through the kibo cristalis uh profile itself i just specify the url of the profile page itself to get live i had to apply approximately seven times over the time span of like 1.5 years uh but the recent application that i did got approved really really fast and it happened once they basically simplified is nightlight on no it happened once they basically simplified the application process so i think personally that they're just approving people uh in a more lax manner uh, as opposed to how they were approving before because before i think they were manually reviewing everybody whereas now it's more automated or as long as you have a certain connection level or a certain uh number of connections they basically approve you or follower uh level as well so depending upon the one of the two definitely worth the shot apply you might get approved and then if you do get approved this basically opens up your content marketing uh the aspect of content marketing it opens up an entirely new sphere because now you can run linkedin events with linkedin live and you can back them up uh you can even just run like proper live sessions like out of the blue and it adds uh to the content marketing standpoint one of the main reasons why i personally like live is and i haven't run one yet is um primarily because you get a notification whenever you go live so people that are connected to you get a notification saying that you're live and they're able to join and basically watch an example of one is essentially here so this person was live that's the title of the live itself etc to launch it once you have it you basically need stream yard and your profile needs to be like accepted and of course verified and then you just basically launch to a third party app like stream yard and essentially your life so if you're running an event do it on linkedin live um more than 100% sure that the conversion should essentially increase but that's essentially that on the topic of add-ons so linkedin add-ons there's a lot uh there's a lot but and i won't to to go into every single one like one by one right now would be like just it be a, an entire other 4 hour session uh but the key thing that i basically want to mention is you have two types of add-ons you have chrome extensions and then you have cloud solutions as well uh, chrome extensions right now are generally framed upon and take this more as a risk warning uh because they breach the terms and conditions of linkedin in many cases uh so a lot of accounts are generally being banned for using automation tools or anything of that sort or enrichment tools so be very very careful and understand the risks involved with using add-ons so if you just type in linkedin on the chrome web store you have everything so octopus linkedin automation uh email finder pp leads uh linkedin extension toothless i don't know what this does etc but you have a lot essentially and you can you can find a lot more the cloud tools like uh, zopto if i'm not mistaken also offer the exact same thing so automation but on the flip side uh they're cloud based so they connect to your account through oauth if i'm not mistaken i'm not a dev uh and then they basically uh just use the api to basically control your account on the back end so it's less traceable again it breaches terms and conditions linkedin's countermeasures right now for automation and anything of that sort have like increased tremendously so it's not even worth the risk to the point uh, at this point which is exactly why you see me covering more conventional linkedin marketing methods like email campaigns for example um but definitely just something to consider so 
a lot of different add-ons. Uh, be careful from the risk standpoint. But then again, on the flip side, you have less risky tools as well. Like there's um, social selling tools that basically tell you, I keep forgetting the name of this one, but there's a couple of YouTube videos about it. Uh, social selling tools basically telling you how to best reach a person, what interests you might share, uh, what topics you can basically converse about. These help. I don't think they breach the terms and conditions of LinkedIn, but uh, if you're a, uh, a business developer, BD, or sales executive getting started on LinkedIn, keep this in mind and try to just be careful of the fact that your account can get banned. But essentially, yeah, uh, that was the LinkedIn Live segment. So at the moment, it's to application only. I'll post the link for the application in the description below. Um, this was the segment with regards to the add-ons as well. I would showcase a couple of add-ons, but uh, the YouTube channel and all the previous videos that we have essentially showcase all of them. But essentially, yeah, um, make sure to, if you missed any segment, make sure to basically check the timestamps in the description below. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, guys. Uh, it's been a, a bit of a like video marathon, like over the past 72 hours, just pumping, pumping, pumping uh, to basically get this content out. But I think it's worthwhile. Uh, if you enjoyed it, drop a like, leave a comment, etc., just to help the algorithm itself. And make sure to check our growth hacking community. So if you're in B2B and uh, this content has been helpful to you, uh, make sure to check growth.insideinside.at, which is the first pinned comment under the video, and join our community. Uh, a lot of free value, top level free value, especially for B2B and B2C as well. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys on the next one.